As you know, I quite enjoy it when we have a guest that can basically talk about any topic. He's not stuck to one kind of brand, one kind of product, one kind of production uh, facet. He can really I, I bring on a guest that can speak about pretty much any subject. And that's who we have in the shape of my guest tonight, Ingmar Rond. It's his third time stepping behind the bar, the bar at the V-Pub. And this time, rather than focus on the malt whiskey yearbook or Ingmar's past and the topics that we've covered in the past, trying to predict whiskey's future, what I thought we could do is take the topics that he's asked his guests in this year's um, malt whiskey yearbook and turn those questions on Ingvar himself. He seems to like the idea. I'm struggling with a cold, but regardless, we'll continue and I'll see you in a second. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday night. Welcome back to the VPUB. Apologies for being selfish and taking a break last week. We had a family holiday, two families together, my brother and I, both of our families. We went up all over Scotland for a week and took um, a really quite remarkable break away from whiskey. In fact, we had very little whiskey over the course of the holiday. And despite traveling past in and around about 12 to 15 different distilleries all over the West Coast, the islands and the highlands, I stepped over the threshold of none. It was a remarkably whiskey free week. And since then, it's been a whiskey free week, too. And I think it's caused a problem <laughs> because for somebody who doesn't ever suffer from colds and those kind of infections and things, I've been struggling for about a week now. Um, but I'm OK now. I'm tasting my whiskey, more or less, um, just a wee bit blocked up. But uh, I'll reach for the mute button tonight if there's any coughing or spluttering. And apologies if my voice is uh, a wee bit odd tonight. But that's the reason. Anyway, I hope you, you are all in better health than me. Um, and I hope you're looking forward to another uh, session with a, a guest tonight. As I mentioned there, on it's, it's kind of fun actually that I mentioned to Ingvar before we, we went live. This is his third time stepping behind the bar. Uh, back in, I think it was as far back as 2020 during lockdown he first came on. Um, and then we did a session where we looked ahead to, I think it was... 2022, it might have been 2021, I'm not sure, 2022, I think, we did a kind of uh, how the future is going to shape up for whiskey. Uh, this time, what I was inspired by is I took his book away with me on holiday, his brand new malt whiskey yearbook, have it here, and I was reading through it, and the questions that he put together for some of his, uh, uh, or some of the whiskey uh, Hall of Fame inductees were quite interesting questions. And as they were being answered in the Malt Whiskey Yearbook by each of these individuals with their own very unique perspective on whiskey, I realised that what was missing was the author's perspective on his own questions. What does he think? And now they've been answered and published and things, I thought eh, I'd eh, put his own questions to him. I hope you think that's a fun idea. Eh, I am looking forward to it, certainly. Um, there's a wee bit of housekeeping to do tonight, but what I'll do before I get into that, while everybody's drawing up their bar stools and topping up their glasses and getting comfortable, I'll jump into the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated bar flies. So good to see so many of you in already. Thank you as always for the support. Justin Wan is in saying good evening, Roy. Hopefully you're feeling better. I'm actually feeling okay. I'm feeling okay in myself. Um, just, you know, that head cold sensation, Justin. So we should be able to get through tonight without any hitches. We hope my last is Mike is here. Good evening, Roy. Really looking forward to this. I'm surrounded by whiskey yearbooks and drams. Someone pinch me. Fantastic, Mike. Good for you. Um, I'm looking out for orange as always, by the way. So if you're trying to get my attention, uh, in order for me to see that orange, just type Aquavite or at Aquavite. As long as you've spelt it right, it highlights, and I should probably be able to pick up your comments, hopefully throughout tonight. Hells with us here saying, welcome back, cold and all. Hope you had a fabulous break. Helen, I really, really did. It was a great, great time, and shows that you don't always need whiskey themes to have a good holiday. Uh, 
uh, my brother's uh, my brother actually said to me that out of all the uh, domestic holidays that he's had in the UK, that the, the week we had together was probably his favourite. It was just we were treated with the weather. We didn't have rain at all the whole week, which was crazy. Some days we had gorgeous blue skies, really calm weather. Um, that seasonal change, some crisp days. If we went up mountains and things, it was obviously windy and blustery. But down uh, uh, closer to sea level, it was very, very calm. It was fabulous, Helen. Good to see you, and I hope you and Andy are well. Whiskey Weekend, Ram Harrow is saying cheers to you then. Cheers on you then, he's saying. Uh, good to have you in, Harrow, and cheers to you as well. Pete Head Frank is saying great, great to have you in tonight, Roy. Uh, Frank, I, I missed you last week. Uh, it's good to be back. Great. Ryan Sutherland's in as well. Good to see you, Ryan. And Danny Hebbington is here. Good to see you, Danny. Good evening, Roy. Danny, I wonder if you got the update about what we did with Jimmy Legg's bottle. We bought, we bought him a bottle with you and Rob Too Slow's donations. We bought him a bottle of the three-week uh, fermentation Loch Lomond. Um, I know for a fact that he was determined to get a bottle. He was really after a bottle. I read a comment of that uh, very nature. And we managed to unite Jimmy with a bottle of uh, Loch Lomond Extra Long Fermentation, and it went down very, very well. So thank you to you and to Rob as well. wonder if anyone got any pictures of that, actually. Certainly there was some video floating around. Julian Rickman is saying, Evening, Roy. Evening, Barflies. Looking forward to the annual insights from the great man, Ingvar, and his indispensable annual Bible. Uh, me too, Julian. Me too. Alistair Gray saying, Good evening, Barflies. And... Uh, Bible's already been reserved for someone else's book, though, right? I know I kind of refer to this as my own kind of personal wee whiskey. But do a Bible or kind of friend? I'm not very sure. It's more like a companion to me. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it too, uh, Julian. And Alistair Gray saying, good evening, Barflies and Aquavite. Good to see you, Alistair. I think I might have a chance to meet you in a couple of weeks' time for the Glasgow Whiskey Festival weekend. Rick Johnson is saying, good afternoon from San Francisco, Roy, fellow Barflies. Sorry to hear about your cold. Ah, it's no big deal, Rick. Um, it's just a wee bit of man flu, isn't it? It's just something to complain about. <laughs> something to... I should be maybe trying a wee hot toddy or something like that. Uh, see if it, if it actually does work. Uh, okay, I've just the chat jumped and I, I missed a hell of a lot of it there. Jimmy Legg is in. Much to my surprise, I missed you and these great whiskey people last week. Much to my surprise, I missed you all too. I always do. Can I? I always do. It's always odd on a Thursday night. I kind of well, well, wonder what the barflies are doing. I wonder, wonder what's happening and things. Um, I get used to it over summer uh, and then I get excited to come back again. Uh, I'm certainly excited to be back here tonight. Uh, it feels comfortable, despite all the stuff that's going on in the background for the Oswas on the weekend. More about that to come. Ryan Sutherland saying, Evening, Roy. Good to hear you're on the mend. Thank you, Ryan. Good to see you in, buddy. And Cesare, hello, whiskey malt folk. Uh, Aquaviti, Barflies, and Roy. Good to have you in, Cesare. Hope you're doing well. Alan Hopper Stewart is here. Good to see you, Stuart. Evening, Roy. Alan Smith, Thomas F. A hot toddy will sort you. He's recommending. And Thomas is saying, Evening, Roy. Good to hear the cold is clearing. It is. Tom Elmer is here from Alaska. Fantastic, Tom. Evening, Barflies, even, sir. And Drew from Arizona. Greetings, Roy. Good to see you, Drew. Hope you were keeping well. My pal Gav from uh, East Coast. Gav's drams is in. Good to see you back. Great, uh, glad to see you back. Good to see you, Gav. Well, I see you over the course of the weekend. I hope so. Uh, the weekend coming up in Glasgow. Excess to Scotch is saying good evening, Roy. I'm hyped for Saturday. He's talking about the Online Scotch Whiskey Awards, of course. Good to hear it. Fantastic. Ross Brerer to the same evening, Roy. Hope you had a good break. Also feeling a little rough with a cough that started today. Hopefully a dram or two can sort it out. Well, I've been choosing to not have drams, and it stayed around a wee bit too long, Ross. So good luck with the whiskey. I think you might be in a better track than me. Cheers. Justin Wan is in and celebrating being a member of Barflies for six months. Sancho Varoy. Never take health for granted. You're absolutely right. You really are. Uh, jump the chat, chat jumps again. I'll, again, I'll scroll up. Uh, Gene Kelly, great name, Gene Kelly. Glad to hear you had such a wonderful travels. No need to apologize for being away. Thank you, Gene. Thank you so much. James DeGiulio saying, uh, Gail tried to give me a project last week. Oh, I wonder what that was to book another trip. Orange Will Rule is in saying, even though I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Of course, you're coming over for the festival. Fantastic rule. Brilliant stuff. Um, I feel like we've met before, though, right? Maybe have we? Maybe not. Have we? It's difficult to keep up. <laughs> Highland Hamish is saying greetings from Inverness. It's difficult to keep up when people have aliases, right? And then you meet them and it's obviously real names and you all, your memory loses the attachment over time. Highland Hamish, I remember we've, we've met before. 
Uh, greetings from Inverness. Good to see you, Hamish. Craig Dollar is saying, uh, good to see you, Aquaviti. We should probably keep our virus faces away from each other until the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. Craig, I hope you're on the mend, buddy. I know that you've been struggling too. We need you for Glasgow Whiskey Festival weekend, big guy. So I hope that you're sorted for then. I'm hoping to be sorted well in advance of that too. Anyway, let's go on with tonight. Um, I will try and drop in throughout tonight uh, and pick up your questions and things like that, uh, just in case the inevitable conversation between myself and Ingvar might uh, prompt some curiosity. The housekeeping is fairly straightforward. <laughs> this is the last week where I get to I have to restrict my uh, dialogue on whiskies. I've got some independent bottles out here in front of me tonight. Um, it's the Oz was will be done and dusted come this time next week. It'll be done and dusted by Saturday night on the 4th of November, this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. Ralphie and I will be here together and we will share what the winners are for 2023. We will share with you what you have voted for. We will tell you the outcome of all your own votes. <laughs> And I know a lot of you, if it's like any other year, are not going to like it. <laughs> but it's nevertheless, it's what you want, it's your votes. It's super, super transparent as usual. We'll share with you um, everybody that's been involved. We'll share with you the counts and things like that. And the thing I always look forward to as well is the people's choice, that kind of top 10 chart of what you, despite what people and out there in uh, YouTube and review land and podcast land and whatever, wherever they're from, despite what they've put forward for their nominations, you like to get involved and share what your top 10 is as well. And it's interesting how that changes year to year. What was always fascinating for me is what is reliably consistent year to year. It's not finished yet. We're still putting the, the final crosses on the T's and the dots on the I's, but by six o'clock on Saturday, we should be ready to share all with you. And I'm looking forward to that. Please share it with your Scotch whiskey loving friends and community around you. And if, they're, if they find themselves free on Saturday to pour something nice, put their feet up and watch along. The only other thing to talk about, of course, is the Glasgow Whiskey Festival weekend. I um, try to host an event every Sunday after the main festival event. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the main festival event first. There are some people gathering in the pot stall on the Friday night as they come into town. Please don't have too much. There's going to be so much whiskey on the Saturday. The worst thing you can do is spoil your appetite to try all that wonderful new and exciting whiskey at the festival. However, it's exciting and it's good fun. I'm hoping to get along to the pot stall myself just for a wee handshake and hello, uh, probably quite late on in the evening on Friday night too. If I get a chance to drop in, I'll probably hopefully see you there. But even if I don't, there's going to be a bunch of barflies there, a lot of known faces. Thereafter, we'll be meeting. It's obviously the 12 o'clock session that most of us are going to. And that means that we'll be out of there for half past three, four o'clock. There's a bus waiting for us. Uh, to take us all up to Akbar's. Hopefully you've had your name down for the bus, you've paid your bus fare, you've got your name down for the Akbar's uh, meal ticket at night, and we can get something nice to eat before we roll around for a nightcap at the Bon Accord. And that draws the Saturday of the Glasgow Whiskey Festival, the festival day itself, to a, a close for the majority of the bar flies. I know a lot of you will be going along to the second session, which is great too, and maybe we'll bump into you at the Bon Accord a wee bit later. On the Sunday, I'm hosting an event this year again, but I couldn't release anything, any details about it. I couldn't even release tickets about it. I tried and tried to get a venue that was bigger. And in the end, I had to book last year's venue. It can hold a maximum of somewhere in the order of 50 people. And I was, I'm managing a, a number that's much, much bigger than that. And to try and fit everybody in and to try and work out how I can make this event work on the Sunday. So that's why I've been very quiet about it over the last few weeks, because I just can't square the circle. I can't make it fit. Um, what it's made me realise, and the reason I bring it up tonight, is that there's an appetite for more of these events. And that being the case, I will attempt to bring more of them in the future. And maybe we don't always have to wait until the Glasgow Whiskey Festival to host these events with enough notice. And a well-chosen weekend, we could have barflies coming together for a pretty uh, exclusive thing, something a bit more about us and a bit more intimate and things like that as well. So if you're open to that and interested in that in the future, that might help to solve uh, some of the disappointment that's out there for the folk that I know are going to struggle to get up on the Sunday event this year. 
I just can't find a venue that's that's the biggest problem. Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I hope you're all having a fantastic time. So sorry I missed a couple of uh, Barfly celebrations here. Jimmy Legg is celebrating being a member for 44 months. All of my Oswald votes are 100% correct, of course. Jimmy, you've hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> Listen, for me, it's difficult because what I vote for is not often what the community votes for. Um, sometimes it is, and it's nice to see, uh, but we nobody can have it their own way and it's kind of just settling yourself with the fact that the odds was are very representative of, of something that's much much bigger than any one person any one vote um but we are absolutely right and you're right your votes are 100 percent correct my votes are 100 percent correct even if they don't agree right jimmy fantastic jimmy's celebrating being a barfly he's been a barfly for 44 months what that does because he's hit that join button underneath the window here today, unless you're on an Apple a mobile device, you might not see it. He clicks that 199 of your currency, wherever you are. You become a channel member, you get access to the emoji and the loyalty badges and things, all very whiskey themed. But what it does is it keeps all the Aquaviti content in the future and all the VPUBs absolutely ad free. You don't have to sit through ads. I don't monetize the video content because of the support from Barflies. Thank you all so much. My funding is through Patreon. If you search Patreon for Aquaviti, you'll see what that's all about in there too. Says Ari the Fly is saying, uh, celebrating being a member for six months and saying it's fun to be here with you guys live in a VPUB. Says Ari, I think you're out in Poland. I think you're in in Europe somewhere. I'm going to guess Poland, my friend, but it's nice to have you all here. Jimmy, Justin Wan, and Cesare. Cheers. Okay. We've got quite a few questions to get through tonight, so let's not keep our, our guest waiting too long. As I say, um, Ingvar has been on the VPUB twice before, and every single time I've spent time chatting to Ingvar, whether it's been on a live VPUB or otherwise, has always been a pleasure. He's a gentleman, a knowledgeable, and more important than anything else, passionate whiskey enthusiast. And that's what makes it a pleasure to have him here. Let's invite behind the bar once more my friend Ingvar Rond. Good to see you. Good to see you, Roy. And I know that I have mispronounced your name again. Rond? Yeah, I will, let's not do the Swedish pronunciation because that's impossible. So Ron, let's hear it. Let's hear it from you. Rande. Rande. Yeah, but you, you say Rande. I'm used to that. I'm used to that. Fantastic. You know, they, 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 there's this umlaut on the O. So uh, I decided already in 2005 to skip the two dots of the O because. Uh, I thought people wouldn't be able to pronounce it. So, Rond, that's good. So, you've just become Rond. That's. Yes, yeah, I've become right. a new person. I'm Rond now. Well, uh, Ingvar, should, Ingvar should be a bit easier. I'm pronouncing that well, right? Ingvar is okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Good. Yeah. Good. And now, I'd, I noticed your reaction when I mentioned before we went live tonight that you've been on the VPUB three times now. This is your third time here. That's right. That's right. I, I hope you're feeling comfortable here. It's always a yeah, pleasure yeah, to yeah, have yeah. you. Yeah. It's a very nice room to be in, absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. And I want to say, I can say, personally, I can say a big thank you live for us. I was going to bookmark it, but I haven't bookmarked it. Uh, for the, this channel gets a wee mention in the yearbook since last year. Thank you so much. This is the second year. And also the Dramface project as well, which I'm very appreciative of. And actually, when you look through that little list that you've put together of online resources, it's a pretty decent list of stuff so if anybody's looking for other content out there to get to read and consume and learn from and get participate in there's a no better place to start i'm going to spend a minute ingvar and i know that that's not the purpose of tonight plugging the yearbook you know how much of this channel is built on the back of this little book or yeah. do you know i i know part of the quiz sometimes is, is based on the book and i'm really proud about that but, the, you know, people say, where do you get the ideas for the themes for the VPUB? And the, there's no such thing as an original idea. None of them are my ideas. They're all taken from inspiration from somewhere else. Something about whiskey makes me think about something, and yeah. it, then it leads to a topic, and that's where they come from. So much of it is through just random little nuggets and details and specifics in this little book. And as you quite rightly said, the quiz at the end 
it's not entirely built on facts from this book, but if somebody is using this book and referring to it, they, they will find their quiz scores at the end mm. ramping up considerably, I'm sure. If they're anything like me, as we get older in life, it's harder to retain the facts and details, right? But that's why it's some of these are really well thumbed. Some of them are rolled up and in an inside pocket. Some of them yeah. are in my backpack. And um, this is a, what, when I say it's a companion, I really, really mean that. You, so, another you know, good book. Sorry? You know, Roy, I, I'm, I'm still blushing when, when I hear stuff like this. And, and uh, I was also surprised to, to be aware of the fact that the industry, that they are using it. I mean, yeah. people, uh, the producers, using it for uh, the brand ambassadors, uh, tour guides, and, and uh, gifting it to all the employees. I, I never, ever anticipated that when I started doing the work. I mean, I did it for myself. I did it for the ones that are, are together this evening. I mean, um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm still astonished, to be honest. And yet, you felt the desire and the need for it. By the way, if anybody's interested in the origins of the uh, uh, the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, uh, go back to the 2020 Ingvar Rond uh, session on the VPUB, where that's that was the topic. Where did it come from and what was yeah. the inspiration behind it and everything like that. It was a fantastic session. But you felt a need and a desire for the yearbook. And I, I think that, that a lot of other people did too, but they didn't have the background in publishing. They didn't have the wherewithal or the idea mm -hmm. how they could put, put something like that together. Ingvar, all I'll ask you is, listen, I know how tiring projects can be. Uh, the Oswes are just kind of a, they're not all year round, but it's very intense when it's here. Dramface is all year round. It can be intense at times. The channel, of course. But this book is a monster now, despite it not changing in size, the scope of this. I and I will argue with you that you're forced every year to simplify and make things more and more succinct, which is mm. actually much more challenging <laughs> yeah. than, than it just is. Uh, I, I, I made one hard decision this year and I had to skip everything about closed distilleries. Yes. Um, I, I know that there are some people out there who, who I mean, in the first years, every closed distillery, Colburn or, or Milburn or whatever, they had one page each because, I mean, remember at that time, we were able to find both things from these closed distilleries uh, and at a reasonable price. Yes. Uh, and now, 20 years later, more or less, uh, most of them are completely gone. Once yeah. Blue Moon, we find a banned from signatory or or some other odd bottlings but it didn't justify for me to have an entire chapter about closed distilleries so uh, as hard as it was because i love whiskey history so i, I love writing about it and, and cover it but to be honest nothing happened there no bottlings left more or less so I had to make more space for, for new distillers. <laughs> we, we all know there are so many new distillers every year. So that part of doing the book, working on the book, is quite hard. And we're not just talking about five, six, seven new distillers in Scotland every year. We're talking about hundreds of new distillers in Australia and, and South America and uh, France, everywhere. So Even yeah. although you've just specifically chosen malt distilleries to cover you're still given more than you can possibly you can't catch them all surely no 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 I, I i would i would say that no one in the world has any idea exactly how many more distilleries are in the world i don't yeah and i don't think anyone else does i mean it's i i, I try my best to cover everything but then sometimes when you have a suspicion that, yes, there, sh there probably is a couple of more distilleries in, in uh, let's say, in Thailand. or there sh I remember a few years ago, I couldn't really verify that there were more distilleries in China. I tried to get in touch with some of them. Was it really more whiskey? Did, was it made from grain, etc.? And now I have at least six or seven. I know there are probably 26 distilleries in China. But it's also about verifying, getting information 
that I can print in the book. Yeah. If, if I'm not sure, I, I won't print it. I won't write about it. So I have to be sure. I have to have some kind of verification from the producer that's uh, reliable. Well, that if, we, if, we, if we take if we take a look at the the, the section as it split it here, the fatter section here is still fully focused on Scotch malt whiskey distilleries. This is Scotch malt, and obviously, obviously the editorial content and the, the articles and things at the front. Yeah. The rest of it is uh, distilleries around the globe. It's more of a summary content, and also the the the, the year that was and all the industry data yeah. and stats yeah. at the at, at the back. So you can see that your focus is still um, still uh, towards uh, dedicating a page to each of the Scotch malt distilleries. So Absolutely. despite you trying to be as inclusive as possible, it's clear that the focus is still for that. And for that, I'm very, very grateful. Yeah, um, and I, I think we can go back to 2005 when I did the first book. I did it for me because I needed it. <laughs> And uh, I was hoping that there would be other geeks who would like to have a yearbook about malt whiskey. But going back to that, I mean, Scotch whiskey has always and still is closest to my heart. Um, most of my readers, I, I know, they, they think the same. So uh, that's why it's justified that every, not every, but most of the Scottish distilleries, they have one page. Uh, just a few have two pages, and then I know <laughs> because I watched I watched your um, your when you had Francis Cuthbert from Daphnel yeah. on yeah. the show, and you you started with the oldest of the new distilleries, <laughs> and yeah, I, 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 I had that question so many times. What's a new distillery? I mean, Daphnel has been around since two thousand and five, and we talked about it, Roy, and I, I can explain to others here that. I, I decided that all the distilleries that were open after Kilhoman in 2005 were to be called new distilleries. Because with the new distilleries, apart from uh, when they make their first bottling, very little happens. Uh, the old distilleries, okay, let's take uh, Inchgower or Alta Bain, very little happens there, but it can always do something new in the next yearbook about the history of Inch Gallery, sure. or, or the equipment at Alter Bain, or, or talking about Seagrams and Sam Bronfman, who, who built Alter Bain and Braywald in, in the 70s. And yeah. you can talk about the blends. And so there's more to build on with the older distilleries. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, but also, I mean, I can understand it because in the context of when you're building the, the yearbook from 2005 onwards for the 2006 edition, you know, uh, you, Colhoman was at least on the horizon. Mm -hmm. But as it turned out, you were, we were going to have to wait until probably the 2017 or 2018 year edition before you could actually have a release to talk about from Daft Mill. Um, so it's, it's all, it's, it's about when the, when the, when the distillery not only is operational, but when it, when it becomes commercially active as well, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so, I mean, Francis is a great, great man. I, I like him very much. And uh, what he's done with uh, Daphne is uh, fantastic. But the thing is, nothing happened, at, at least that I could write about over 10 years. I mean, yes. every year I ask him, so when are you going to read? Re release your first whiskey when it's ready when it's yeah. ready always same answer so, yeah. yeah well uh, with francis it was always it's not good enough yet it's not good enough yet so yeah it's yeah just crazy exactly. and, and a, a lot of people got a great um idea of, of how fantastic a guy francis is when he was on a few weeks ago yeah um and he and he took it he took it with a, a glint in his eye and a tongue in a cheek right he's just he had to he's, he kind of I don't, I don't think he minds too much. Justin Wan has bought me a wee dram. Thank you so much, Justin. He said, any chance, a good question actually, Ingvar, any chance that the yearbook will be on Kindle in the future? Uh, um, I'm not sure. It, it, it's not in the plans. Um, whenever I get that question, or should I do an app as well, yeah. uh, I, I just try to explain. I'm, I'm probably the most analog person in the world. Uh, I, I love printing books on paper. I love 
the feeling that you, you can sit in your chair, you have your favorite whiskey, you can flick through uh, the yearbook, you can write small notes on it. So don't, don't count on a Kindle version. Don't count on an app. Um, but you, you never know. I mean, there, there are people in my surrounding and the younger, way younger than I am, and they try to influence me and say, well, it's not that difficult thing, but you should try to do something and we'll see. Well, uh, for me, speaking personally, I can see the value, the ease of use, the comfort or, or whatever of having something that we could have an account on or, or an app to carry in our pocket. But I do love the tactile side of this. This is a very familiar thing to me. I know exactly where to go in the book anytime I need the information. I don't need power or battery. I don't need to log in. I don't need to remember my password. It's just very, I get it, Ingvar. And there's no pressure from me to, to take it in that direction. I think perhaps it's maybe inevitable at some point in the future. It might make your workload a lot more linear if it became electronic. But we did say that this wouldn't be an, a specifically a malt whiskey yearbook session tonight. And I'd, I'd like to do that. I'd raise a glass to Justin and say thank you for the drama, friend. Cheers. Mm. But we do want to, one thing I do want to ask you is that every every year in the, for the yearbook, you have to think up new themes, new topics, new, new things to pitch to writers, I suppose, or you ask them to pitch to you. But there's usually a kind of theme that runs through you asking multiple guests the same questions. Mm. But we've never really had Ingvar given us his answers to the questions that are rattling around in his own head, right? And I, when we had the call on as, as recently as Monday this week, and I pitched the idea to you, you paused for just a microsecond, smiled, and then said, ah, okay, that's actually quite a good idea. You seemed yeah. okay with it, right? Yeah, and certainly, absolutely. And certainly not something that was going to, that was going to uh, put you off. But it, when I was reading through this and these questions on holiday, from Sukender, from Alan Winchester, from all the people that you asked, I thought, I actually want to know what Ingvar is thinking of these answers. What, what's in his head? What does he? How would he answer these? So that's where I came up with a topic for what we're going to talk about tonight. It's a much better topic. I, 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 think, I think it's a good idea, Roy, because I'm always the editor who presents other people's views. So yes. here's a chance for me to present my own views. And, and we want to hear them. We do want to hear them. So let's, we've, we're going to try and get through as many questions as we can. There's no pressure on us. If we want to meander and take the conversation in any direction that we want, we, it's the VPUB. We don't rush, right? We just, whatever time is taken is taken. So we'll, we'll, pick, we'll play it by year. And if we have to draw it short, we'll clip to the last question. And then I'll try and bully you in to stay in for the quiz at the end, okay? If that sounds like a good way to spend your evening, I'm up for it. Ingvar, the first question that you posed to, I think it was, how what connected all of these people? Six people? Six, yeah, yeah. What connected I mean, them all? all? All six were, I, I mean, I, I wanted to hear something from some of the whiskey icons in the world, and uh, uh, the denominator was that they had all been inducted into the Whisker Hall of Fame. And... Um, I, Terrific people, all of them. I, I met most of them on various occasions. And, uh, and then the thing is, I mean, a caveat here, be, be, because you never know what kind of answers you will get. Yeah. Some of them are more candid than others. Uh, some of them are maybe trying to, to, to keep the, the, the position in, in the industry. They, they go into the industry role and I have to say something very, very specific and, and smart and nice about the, the future of whiskey. So sometimes you, you, you realize it's, it maybe isn't their personal opinion, but that, that's the way. If, if you want to interview people, you, you can't tell them what to, what to say. That would be stupid, of course. So. But, um, yeah, that's, that's that's true, and I think that that you have to always respect that some people have sensibilities to preserve. You know, they they have because they are in a role. It would almost be absurd for them to speak out against the thing that their daily role requires yeah. of them, unless right, yeah, yeah, 
you know. And, 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 and when, when, whenever I do the more whiskey book, I'm I'm not looking for a scoop, uh, something uh, fantastic that no one else had heard about. Uh, of course, I, I want to cover all the news, but I don't want to put anyone on the limb and okay, here's what this and that person said, and it, it's. Uh, no, I think I think your book, we have to remember the audience and how it's pitched and the tone that it has to take is pitched perfectly. It's not a daily news. It's not something to be a bit edgy or anything. It's something to be matter of fact and to portray things as they are or as they mean and intend to be portrayed. And I think it does that very, very well. And as a factual, I'll use the word again, companion, <laughs> I think it's perfect for that. And I think it's nice that it's not just a yearbook with uh, stats and detail updated every year, that you do go to editorial effort and there's there's some fantastic articles and faces in there to see every year as well. And it's, it's a pleasure to read. And I'll argue further than that. For people who are going back, the completists out there and collecting the back catalogue, it's just as interesting as today's copy because of the snapshot in time that each yearbook represents. Anyway, we're back onto the yearbook again. The thing that linked all of these people were the inductees to the Hall of Fame, and you asked them 10 questions. Big Ed has bought us a dram to say great VPUB. Big Ed, that might be the first time I've welcomed you here. Thank you for the drama, friend, and nice to have you enjoying. So let's pull up your first question that you pitched. And I think we don't need to dwell on this one because you've been on the VPUB once or twice before. What was your objective? Ingvar, for entering the whiskey business. What, you're in the whiskey business now, aren't you? I'm in the whiskey business. I am, sort of. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's so strange because I, I was on national television in, in Sweden a couple of weeks ago, and they wanted to know how to introduce me. So, so obviously, we, we should, you've written 28 books, so we should call you a whiskey expert. That's the last thing you should call me. I mean, expert, that's reserved for people who make whiskey. Yeah. So never never call me an expert. I, I, I mean, I, I'm observer. I'm a lover of whiskey. I write about it. But uh, so I, the reason I, I came into, into uh, as you say, the whiskey business is, like I said, I, I needed, I had this interest in whiskey, which... And that dates back to 1980. I, th I, th I think I had a rather unusual introduction to whiskey. Most of the people uh, that are here, maybe they were offered a dram from a friend who knew about whiskey. Come to my place, I'll pour your whiskey. Uh, or yep. they were in a bar together with friends. And my first introduction to, to whiskey was going to Scotland, going to distilleries in 1980 in the summer. I knew nothing about more whiskey at the time. I rented a car, I heard about the whiskey trade, I went around to Glendale, Glenfedic, Strat Island, Glenfarkas, etc. And knew nothing about it. Because I was completely, I was so intrigued by the people who made it, the, the place where it was made. And I think that has followed me ever since. Uh, so, so my relation with whiskey is very much all these other things. I mean, and also, of course, what's in the glass, that's important, but all the other things, especially the people making it. And uh, so it became an interest, and I, I needed to keep on track what, what happened. And I, there was nothing, there were whiskey books, of course, but they became outdated very quickly. So I realized that there has to be a yearbook. So that's why I started. So there you go. Yeah, so your objective <laughs> was to help yourself, I suppose. Yeah. That's what you're summarizing. You needed yeah. it for yourself. And yeah. that that incidentally brought, I know that you're still, you perhaps have other projects and things going on, but I, I, I don't know. I have to consider myself today. I, I, my job is in whiskey now. I, it's crazy to say those words out loud. It really is. Yeah. But do you feel something the same? I don't know. It, it's it's still kind of crazy to me because, uh, I mean, if you're in the whiskey business, it's always been for me that you're either distilling whiskey, you're blending whiskey, you're selling whiskey, but I'm a writer. 
Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to make whiskey. I, I wouldn't be able to do it. I would. I, I think be, I probably would be able to pick out a, 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 a cask in a warehouse and uh, and uh, do a single cask bottling. I mean, anyone can do that. But to to blend the whiskey, a consistent whiskey, year after year. I mean, the the blenders. Amazing people, the people who are producing it, the distillers. These are the experts. These are, of course, the backbone of the whiskey industry. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm still. It's very funny. typical of your modesty. I agree with you fully. Those guys cannot, we will never have any concept of just how much they know. No. We will never. And it's, it's incredible. And if, if any time that you spend, it's not even the facts that they're sharing, but it's the way that they share the facts betray mm. just how much knowledge and understanding yeah, they have. You, the you, you're right, Roy. I, I, I'm so every time I come to Scotland, I try to, to come over three, four times a year and, and, and spend a week in different parts of Scotland. And every time I go to this distillery, I'm so grateful to be able to tap into all that knowledge uh, that I find at with, with a distiller. Is there a manager or a blender or whoever that they will take some time to, to with me to, so, so I can write something about it and I, I can I can learn more because I learn more every time I, I've been I've been around distilleries probably four or five hundred times I mean some of them I've been to ten times and people ask me why do you go back to Glen Murray You've been there 10 times and you go there an 11th time. I say, I always learn something new, even if it's a tiny bit of knowledge. I'm, I'm so I, I'll, po I'll pose this to you. Each time you learn something new, it reinforces the concept that you know nothing. Yeah, yeah. You, how little you actually know. It's, an, it's incredible, the, the, right? The, exactly. The more, the more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. I yeah. need to know more. But what we are good at is enjoying whiskey on, on alone, contemplating, with friends, sharing. We're good. We know our way around a glass. We know what we like. Mm -hmm. And nobody can be a better expert on that side of things than we can for ourselves and our own preferences and affordabilities and things like that. Yeah. Ted Brooks, that looks like a new name as well, has bought us a dram. Um, no comment on anything, Ted, but I think it's the first time I've welcomed you, so thank you for your dram cheers. And uh, Alex from the Hogsheads has just joined the Barflies. Cheers, Alex. Good to see you. Alex, who also works up at Isle of Rassi Distillery. So here's the next question then, rolling on to how we just finished, almost like it was a, a little segue there, and it's a very consumer-orientated question. What would you do, what would we do perhaps to attract new, young whiskey consumers i wonder if i wonder how relevant young is in there but i think it actually is i think there is relevance to having that word in there but nevertheless that's a question that you pose to your inductees so what we're what we're really saying there is that we're all going to shuffle off at some point right we're all gonna we're all gonna um take our whiskey passion and love with us mm. And in order for whiskey to sustain and for it to be something that can be passed on to future generations, which it absolutely should be wherever it exists, we need it to be interesting, approachable, accessible for younger generations, for the newer whiskey drinkers to come in. Is that the reason for that question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think the important thing here is to, to, to make it interesting and fun and really articulating fun because it's so easy for for uh old whiskey geeks like you and me roy i'm a bit older than you are but that we we make it too difficult i mean uh, i mean drinking whiskey shouldn't be a mystery it, it shouldn't be about having that particular glass and it shouldn't be about uh, it must be over 46% ABV, uh, preferably it should be cast strength, you shouldn't add anything, because that that borders on, on snobbery, and, and that makes it so much harder to bring in new people. 
And uh, I'm also thinking about, I mean, if, if you invite newbies to, to uh, whiskey tasting, and I mean, to be absolutely honest, whiskey tastings, they are not that fun. I mean, you, you, you have six glasses in front of you. You're sitting, you have a person standing in front of you talking about these six whiskeys. It's not really sexy, isn't it? I mean, there should be something more. I think we have to reinvent what a whiskey experience should be. I, I remember I had a chat with Colin Dunn, marvelous yep. brand ambassador. Uh, I think a lot of you. Great guy. Colin's a great yeah, guy. Great guy. Great guy. Uh, absolutely love him. And I remember back in, in London at Whiskey Live, I think it was 15 years ago, and we had this traditional tasting, but okay, let's admit it, Colin is not traditional. I mean, he has all the stories, he's fantastic. So yeah. I would have been happy to just sit in that room with my six glasses. But when we came to glass number five and six, Colin said to all of us, we were 50 people in the room, okay guys, grab the glasses and follow me, okay? So we grab the glasses, 50 people, one glass in each hand, stumble uh, down the stairs, out into the middle of the night, into a park. It took 10 minutes to come there. And he said, okay, stop here. Look up at, 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 at the sky, look at the stars. And imagine that you are on the Isle of Sky. You're having two telescopes here in your glasses. And I'll picture you, uh, what's about sky, talked about sky, and of course we were in the middle of London, but he gave us that moment. Yeah. And when I talked to him afterwards, and he really insisted on, I have to give my audience a moment. I had the same thing with Martin Markwitzson from Highland Park in Helsinki, a couple of years later, uh, the final round of that tasting. We climbed up onto the roof. It was, I think it was 50 centimeters of snow on that roof. And we weren't equipped to walk through the snow, but we didn't care because we had Martin, we had Highland Park, and he gave us that moment. So we have to somehow reinvent what is a whiskey tasting. And, and I, was, I, I think you're bored with these just sitting by your table and drinking glass after glass, trying to come up with some clever tasting notes. I think I think it'd be nice to invite you across to an Aquavite tasting one year. That would be fantastic. <laughs> um, I think you would you would experience a new whiskey tasting uh, idea doing that, and yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing that with everyone a couple of weeks again once more. But I think that would be interesting for you. Um, uh, and thus far, I've not asked anyone to leave the room, but it's a good idea. I think right. what you're talking about there when you talk about setting up structure and having rules and things that are good and not bad and making these statements. I think what you're talking about there is very valid. You're talking about a sense of snobbery, a sense of perhaps gatekeeping almost. Yeah. The idea that it can seem a little bit elitist and difficult for somebody to come into that space when there's so many strap lines and buzzwords and phrases around it in, in order to be seen, to be knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So I think what we have to do there is not change our preferences. If we like 46% in natural whiskey, cast strength, we need to state that and, and state it loudly and justify it. But what we also need to do is remember to always keep an inclusive mindset and an open guiding hand. You're, the, you're one of the rare ones that took that pilgrimage in 1980 off your own back and discovered whiskey for yourself. But you conceded mm -hmm. before that, that most of the people have got a guiding hand, some kind of coach or person to help ease them in and make them realize that it's not a scary place. Yeah. And I think that that's very valid. You make a great point there about not making it stuffy, but making it inclusive. But I think the biggest problem that we've got for our young whiskey generation coming in today, Ingvar, is whiskey has always been an expensive indulgence. It's always been a premium hobby, let's say. And it's been, there's, there's no time that's been more acute than the, the days that we live today, unfortunately. And I think if you look to somebody in their 20s, if you were, if I was to hold up, if so the independent bottles I've got off to the left-hand side here, I'll look for the cheapest one. Probably this, this signatory vintage, I think this was about £40, £38, £40, but I've had this quite a while. 
even 38 or 40 pounds for a bottle of whiskey it, it seems like a lot of money mm. to somebody and and that i think that acts as a bit of a barrier i think that there's been huge strides recently from producers to make things um a little bit more affordable maybe a, a little bit more tongue in cheek a little bit more back to basics a little bit more available that ha that has happened but I think, unfortunately, the big producers who have the stock and the depth of stocks to make that happen, when they do make it affordable, unfortunately, it doesn't represent the quality that would attract somebody in and keep them in. I think it can often taste a wee bit thin, a wee bit half-assed, a wee bit diluted, a wee bit watery. Yeah, yeah. Partly, I, I agree with you, but... Uh, I mean, let's. Uh, I know we discussed White Makai before we discussed Tanabolin. I mean, that that's a good whiskey. I mean, it's uh, in which one? Yeah, I'm thinking of Tanabolin. Uh, oh, yeah, you saw, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, the double cask yeah, and things. Yeah. Red wine finishes. I mean, it, it's yeah. the cheapest whiskey, single malt in, in, in Sweden. It's the best selling single malt in Sweden. I know it's. Uh, making huge progress in, in the UK as well. Um, that's a well-made whiskey at a very decent price, uh, uh, I think around £25 or something. So some of the bigger guys, I mean, they, they, they realize that uh, uh, you, 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 can, you can attract a, a larger consumer group uh, with a decent whiskey, with a good whiskey, and um, at a decent price. Uh, yeah. there, there are other there are other producers that don't make me so happy, um, and uh, Edmonton is is one of them. And uh, I, I, I've I've felt for quite a few years now that they they've lost interest in in me. A classic Macallan fan. Uh, I, I love Macallan since mid 1980s, but it seems to me that they, they are not that interested in, in me anymore. I mean, uh, I, I, I can still buy the Trevio Sherry Oak, but I don't remember when I did it the last time. I think it's quite expensive now. And it seems to me that most of the their efforts go towards uh, the Far East. Uh, and they've been very clear about it. I mean, they want to produce high-end whiskies. Uh, Highland Park is going the same way. Glen Rothes is definitely going the same way. Their new core range starts at 18 years old. We all know what an 18-year-old single malt costs uh, these days. So gone is the 12-year-old, and uh, uh, there was some master, the distillers select. The distillers yes, distillers have. reserve. And the still as reserve, yeah. yeah. So it starts now at 18 years old. So, uh, and fine, it, it, it's their choice, but it seems to me that they decided, no, Ingvar is not our customer anymore. Uh, we are going to do ultra premium single malt, uh, and in particular heading for Asia. So, so be it. Uh, I mean, there are so many other producers, so many other whiskeys. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't cry about it, but I've just noticed that that is their decision. Yeah. Fine. And I'll make my decisions and go somewhere else. I think it would I think it would be nice for a producer. The the producer that you mentioned is valid. A number of producers out there we could I think we could shine a similar torch towards Ian McLeod these days, uh to Diageo certainly. Um a little bit occasionally to Shiva's brothers, Pernod Ricard. There are a lot of producers out there that are kind of following that same line. And there must be a perceived market out there in order to sustain all of these brands, in order for them to people to continue to premiumize. What I am reassured by is that once we get over the bereavement, <laughs> because that's what it can feel like when we yeah. have these whiskeys that we've grown to love and we have an emotional attachment with them. They're taken away from us because we can't afford them anymore or perhaps they're not represented in our market anymore. When that's taken away from us, I'm reassured by the amount of new brands coming along that are really, really driving flavor forward. They're doing natural presentation and somehow most of the time they're managing to pull off this balancing act of bringing out something that's more affordable 
than the traditional brands that have walked away from us as well. So there, there is, they are leaving a wake in order for new brands to come into. And I hope that, that that continues because when you talk about fun and accessibility for that younger audience, that's where I think the excitement lies. Mm. Not in tradition, 200 year old distilleries talking about 200 year old methods and nothing's changed and things as much. That's a good story and it's valid. Mm -hmm. but here's a brand new distillery that's just cropped up on this place here and this is the story behind it and it's every bit as exciting and interesting right but, um, but, but the cool thing is that some of these new distilleries they are looking at uh, there was an article in the latest yearbook back to the future many of these new ones they are looking back at very traditional methods of making yeah. whiskey, direct fire stills, floor malting, uh, heritage barley, uh, worm tubs. But that's that's modern cool. Yeah, it, it, it is. is because you're you're bringing these things that have been lost, and that's that's in, and that's very interesting. So the yeah. idea of of uh, kind of more homogenized, con consistent product made for a much more, um, you know. A, maybe a account friendly uh, you know efficient approach mm. has been a skewed because because there are people out there that are willing to uh, much in the same way that people pursue craft beer and good quality coffees and olive oils and all mm. of these all of these indulgences there, there there's there's space out there for that i think and i think the younger generation today are much more in tune with that than my gen than than i was when i was in my I, I think you're right, but at the same time, we have to realize, I mean, if if uh, guys like Angus McGrail and John McMillan, Bill and Kite, uh, Kite and, and we have Dan Fail, we have Adam Merkin, et cetera, et cetera, and if they are, they are sacrificing yield, yeah. if, if they do floor malting and small production, they are not looking for 420 liters of alcohol per ton barley. Yeah. They, they would be happy for 350 liters. Yeah. So what that's what what happens is that when we see these bottlings in, in five, 10, 15 years from now, they won't be that cheap. I mean, it, there is an expense to, to there is a price to pay if you want to do that old fashioned style whiskey. We have to realize that we love it. You and I love it. Most of us here we love that old style Wait. whiskey. But we have to realize. It may be quite expensive to buy once they release it. Yeah. Well, we are. I mean, we're, we're in a position now that uh, for three, five, seven year old whiskies, we are paying 45, 50, 55, up to 65 pounds yeah. today. Yeah. And often, non age statement, yes, you can find out the details of the cast makeup and a lot of releases and things. You can dive a bit deeper. But generally speaking, we're speaking about non age statements. Our perspectives have changed a little bit now. Mm -hmm. And these seed whiskies, these gateway whiskies, such as the Tam the Villain you mentioned, the supermarket, £25 special offer, things like that, that can bring people in and make them realise whisky can be uh, different from what you perhaps imagined it was if you were ever exposed to the, the cheaper yeah. blends and things in yeah. the past. Malt whisky can offer a different thing. But yeah. what these distilleries are, are, are I think, bringing is, is within the Scotch whisky definitions, fun... Um, and it's 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 ironic that they are dipping into further into tradition, as you point out, further into history in order to bring something yeah. that's yeah. much more modern. But well, I hope I hope that these price points do mean that it's a viable business model for them. Whiskey novice Jim is saying always incredibly interesting here in the YouTube chat. I'll be picking up my copy of the latest edition of the next weekend in Glasgow, Slanchy. Jim, thank you very much for dropping in. Buying us a dram, buddy. That's Jim over at Whiskey Novice Channel. He's coming over to Glasgow for the festival too. And Everwind, my friend Everwind, has just joined the, the Aquaviti Barflies along with uh, Marcus Christensen. Good to see you, Marcus. Uh, thank you very mo much for your support. Cheers to you all. I think your your questions are designed with a little bit of a flow to them because almost another segue in to your next question. Then, if you talk about these old heritage strains of barley, these floor malted and direct fab stills and all of these things, we're speaking about pursuing a different style of whiskey, almost a whiskey that is really being made flavour first. Now, I'm not suggesting that's not meant to be dismissive of whiskey how it's traditionally been made. They always had to meet a minimum quality, no question. 
But in the past, it's been for distillery character for blending purposes, or in the past, it's been for efficiency, perhaps. But today, that's changing a little bit. But you ask an interesting question to quite a lot of people. And this is the one thing, this is the one question I wanted a little bit more, I think, out of people. But I'll ask you, can one whiskey objectively be better than another? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I've been struggling with that ever since I started writing about whiskey. I mean, the obvious answer is no. It's all about your personal taste. Uh, 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 th that's been my position over the years. But then uh, I've been thinking about it, at least for me. I, I can find two things that could make one whiskey better than the other. And especially that's about balance. If I find a balanced whiskey where all the flavors are beautifully integrated and there's a natural flow in when, when the taste, when the flavors appear on, on your palate or uh, on your nose, then you have a good balance. And to me, a good balance is so important. You can also add complexity. I mean, if it doesn't just taste of vanilla and butterscotch or, or dry fruit, you, you have something more to it. Uh, so if you tie these two things together, complexity and balance, uh, at, at least for me, I would be able to say this is more or less objectively a better whiskey than the other. But the basic answer is no, I don't think so. It depends on what you like. I I would like to, uh, I, I can't counter you because I agree with you, but a counter perspective would probably be that I one of the things that I was a little bit struck by when I started to enjoy whiskey was to find this elusive balance, what people were talking about. And eventually what I worked out, what balance meant for me, uh, when I did discover what I feel is balanced whiskey, I needed to have experienced all the extremes. <laughs> yeah. You know, something that is just so ridiculously cask forward that you can barely taste the whiskey, uh, then sipping uh, new make and, and every, uh, even something that's 20 years old, but still tastes spirity, you know, because it's been in a really quiet cask for a long time. All of these things uh, help your, your library a little bit to work out so that when you are given something that's quite detailed and co complex and balanced, that's the kind of okay if i can only choose one whiskey then this is where i'm going to be yeah. but it's interesting i think that we all kind of build up our own individual library experience and i would take it to the point that for the individual one whiskey can objectively be better than another but not to the point where you could confidently recommend it i think no, to, no. To other people. Uh, let, let's uh tie this question in with the previous question about uh production methods and, and the, the way that new distillers are now going backwards to, to, to use old methods. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I see a huge divider right now, especially in Scotland, where you on the one side you have cask-driven whiskies and on the other side you have distillate-driven whiskies. Uh, and I, I won't say that one thing is better than the other. They are different. They are different. Yeah. But uh, many of the new distilleries, they are so, and I, I like that, they are so keen on letting all the work that they've been doing from, from selecting the barley, from, from the malting, mashing, fermentation, distillation, they really want all that work to shine through 10 years later when they bottle that whiskey. Um, yes. That, obviously, that we have the distillate-driven whiskey, so you, you you can sense the distillery character. You can sense uh, the uh, as opposed to if you have a very active uh, PX cask or Oloroso cask, then of course it's uh, wood-driven or cask-driven. So there's nothing wrong with either side. Uh, it's just two different uh, sides of the coin. Uh, but it's, it's become very popular uh, recently to, to, to not, not, not just get rid I mean, all the work that you put into making a good new make, that should 
show in the bottle 10 years later. And I, 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 I don't know, but I, I think that guys like, I, I mentioned uh, Angus and Johnny, I, I think w when they start producing, hopefully within a year or two, I, I think they would be happy to use any tired old bourbon cask they could find <laughs> in order to get as little <laughs> impact well, and, and as possible yeah. from the wood. And I, I think that's really good because if you do put so much focus onto the flavor of the spirit, yeah. you, you rely less on the cask. And you can maybe, um, for a lot of uh, releases, a lot of ideas or concepts go back to the old days when it was just distillery would, you know, they, they didn't really specify or, or spend a lot of time working out what, what was this European or American oak or what was the previous incumbents and things. They just, they filled casks, they just filled uh, distillery wood. Yeah, um, and the, you, you need the cask for transportation. I mean, they, they didn't think about what impact the wood had on on, on, on the whiskey. So, yeah, that's right, that's right. It was made to, to transport a uh, bulk yeah. wine, of course. Yeah. Interesting, and it, th this will segue a little bit onto the next one, and then we have a step change in topic, actually. You're, you're asking here, do you feel, uh, this just this kind of segues us straight on from what you've been saying. Do we feel there is enough innovation in the whiskey business? I, I don't think there can be enough innovation. Um, because, I mean, we as consumers, we can always say that, okay, this was a crazy whiskey uh, matured in an old herring cask. Uh, tastes terrible, so we won't buy it. So, so that whiskey won't sell. But, I mean, innovation is always exciting. We, we need more innovation. And it's not that innovation per se makes a new brilliant whiskey, but we need to try and see, did we come up with something exciting here? I mean, um, and, and, and I mean, if you build your brand completely on innovation, uh, it can work. The problem is if you have an established brand and you start doing all kinds of crazy finishes in, in very peculiar casks, you have to be aware that you build a brand Maybe you had a brand for a hundred years, so th there's a danger in that. Um, I, I think there's a real danger right now with a lot of established brands that just have and new and new brands, honestly, that just have too much, too many releases coming out that it's difficult for us to make a connection with them. Um, mm -hmm. And even for enthusiasts like you and I, who perhaps have much more whiskey around us than um, the average whiskey drinker. Mm -hmm. You, you're um, thinking of the old classic Ben Riak and Brooklady uh, cases where, where 25 new releases every year. I, yeah, I could I could add uh, Glen Scotia to that. I could add, you yeah. know, over the years, there were so many ranges that that, that we struggled with. And mm -hmm. I think they, we should have learned from those. But it's happening today now that the temptation to always have a new product, a new product, a new product, mm -hmm. because let's face it, a new product, you know, it keeps the gears turning. It, it can, and if the gears start to slow and get sluggish again, a new release can speed things up again for a little while. Yeah. But I, when does it get to the point that the whole system is just kind of a bit in need of an oil change? You know, there's yeah, just far too much out there. It's it's gunked it's up. Always, it's always up to us as consumers to say, "I won't buy it." Yeah, you you keep releasing new strange uh, finishes in whatever strange cars i won't buy it as, as uh, i mean if, if they want to do it if, i mean if ben ria 10 years ago if, if, and brought that in, they wanted to release 25 new whiskeys every year uh the only people who were really annoyed were the ones who were collecting and we <laughs> because they couldn't keep up and i or if we talk about collectors i mean you know what i think about Collecting whiskey. Whiskey is sold to be drunk, opened, and not collected. But that, that's, that's another that's another question. Greg's whiskey guy is saying, "I'll rephrase this question, Roy. Do you think there's enough innovation in the Scotch whiskey business?" Uh, I think you're probably right. You make a valid point there, Greg. And he's saying in the bonus question, "Is experimental Scotch becoming a cocktail base?" There's a lot of experimental Scotch is pointed at that market, and I think if you go into any popular bar space you can see the ones that are succeeding there and you can see the reason that they want to 
pursue that. Um, and then to counter it, Jimmy Legg comes in saying innovation is great for most things, but for me, leave single malt Scotch whisky alone, it's a perfect thing. So you've got that kind of quite uh, pragmatic, conservative mindset, but also somebody who's kind of looking at things from a bit more um, kind of global perspective and also the demographic being a bit more global as well, kind of yeah. cocktails and things like that. Listen, when we say innovation, <laughs> it's difficult, right? Because this, the SWA has very strict rules on how you can make something and call it Scotch whiskey. The rest of the world is a little bit more free in how they can approach whiskey making and presenting things to market, I suppose. For me, as long as the focus is on quality, <laughs> um, and then it, when you get to the point where you've made the best product that you can, then kind of, I don't know, it doesn't always need to be about innovate, different, different, different. Mm. It just just be as, as good as it can be, I think. I wonder how much of it that is. Sheldon Cares bought us a dram as well to say, glad to have the V Pub back, and I'm looking forward to the Oswiz this weekend. Big fan of the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. Cheers. Sheldon, thank you very much. You and I are alike in all of those things. Cheers. Mm. So, so what to say it succinctly? We feel there is a lot of innovation, but there can never be too much. Or um, I don't know. I, I I think that there can never be too much because it's always up to us as consumers whether we buy it or not, and decide what's successful by yeah. engaging with it or not. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. And, and it, it, I mean, it's still coming back to, I think it's so exciting that innovation for a few of the new producers is looking back. Uh, I'll come back to that. I think it's hugely interesting that they are looking a hundred years back. Yeah. Down with fire stills and floor molding, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And exactly. I, I would like to add there because um, we think that innovation or looking backwards to, to traditional distilling, it's, it's a smaller producer. Well, what's happened now with the, with the Beam Suntory and what they've been doing with the Langiri, of course, with the floor morphing and Dalit Fire wash still, and they've increased the fermentation to 72 hours at all the five uh, distilleries, not to increase the capacity, but to, to find that classic old Beaumont style or Lafroy style, and especially at Glengarry. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. And the investment from Beam Suntory, it's interesting. I know it's different people that's involved in the direction of the Scotch arm of Beam Suntory these days. And it's interesting to see where the money's being spent because it is with a view to looking to the past, not just at Glengarry, with the, you know, it, you mentioned the floor malt things, the direct fire wash down things, but also using peated malt as well mm -hmm. um, to try and get to get back to that old that old school style. But they're also looking at the other, and I think that that's super exciting for me because the some of the most neglected is the, probably the most polite words I could use to talk about some of the other Beam Centauri uh, distilleries today, Ockintosh and Bamore you mentioned. Um, I, I think that if they could somehow find their 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 sweet spot again, that would be fantastic for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be, I, I really do, I'm excited about everything that's happening at Glengarry. It's going to be a number of years before we can taste the fruits of all of that investment and labour, um, but it's exciting to see. It, it will be a number of years, but I, I think it was fascinating when I was at Glengarry, I think it was last year, and I got to try the new make from uh, the direct fire wash still and from the previous wash still. Uh, and it was so different. All other things were, it was Optic or Decanto or Laureate Barley, same, same <laughs> thing. Just the difference between direct fire and not direct fire. Then we always have to remember that's a new make. So what happens after 10 years in a cask? We don't know. We will see that in 10 years from now. Well, let's hope that you and I are both strong and healthy enough when the time comes to be able to kick back and enjoy it, right? We will be. We're drinking whiskey. We will be. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. <laughs> let's switch it up a bit to something a wee bit more controversial, Ingvar. Yeah. I remind you that these are your questions. <laughs> um, 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it drains the energy out of me. It really does. But it's a whiskey topic and therefore it should be discussed. You know what's coming, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you're, going, you're going to ask a question. It, it, it's like waving a red cape in front of a bull yeah, when yeah. you ask this question. Um, but you did it. Investing in whiskey has become more popular. Is that? And I paraphrase here. I've shortened. I've made your questions a little shorter than they actually were in the yearbook. But is yeah. that a good or a bad thing? Yeah, it's bad. Next question. No, no. Okay, I, I, I'll expand on that. I, I, I met with Ian Buxton, a uh, whiskey writer, for yep. many years, and been part of the whiskey business as well. Look, I'm more marketing director, I think. Uh, I met him a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about whiskey investment. And I reminded him because he's always been very much against investing in whiskey. Oh no, the, nothing to, it will disappear. I mean, it started 15 years ago and he wrote his first articles. This is a scam. Nobody is interested in investing in whiskey. They, so, it doesn't have a future. Um, I reminded him two weeks ago and he said, yeah, that was probably the worst article I ever wrote because look at what's happening now. And I, I, I told him though it was probably the best article you wrote because you were on the moral high grounds here, uh, at least the way I see it, because investing in whiskey, I mean, it, there are so many bad things about it. People can we really get scammed. Uh, it's happening uh, uh, quite a lot now, but also it drives up the prices for for ordinary consumers like you and I, Roy. So that for me, there's nothing good in in uh, selling casks as an investment, selling bottles as an investment, uh, and there's no way of stopping it. I, well, I, it was it was pointed out to me recently that. Um, and I accept this as a perspective, it's true, that I need to be a bit less, I need to be a bit more vocal about this as a topic, but I don't think that that's correct because I'm not an expert there in that area. I'm not an expert in any area, but it's one that I don't feel is within my comfort zone. Um, but it was also pointed out to me that uh, investment in whiskey is a very, very good thing. It's a good thing for the general health and exposure and popularity and just general uh a global perspective on Scotch whiskey and this and brand Scotch whiskey. But you've pointed out some of the chinks in that argument already that how risky it is and how it could very, very quickly be populated fully by bad actors. And a lot of people end up getting scammed on it and things like that. But the fundamental thing for me that always brings me back to it is that you and I discovered whiskey as a very visceral consumable product, the type of, and I always say this thing, you know, there's no, there's no vitamins or sustenance and, or, or, or carbs. Or, we don't drink this for nutrition. The only reason to drink a glass of whiskey is for it to connect with your primary senses and for it to be an indulgence and for it to remind you of what it is to be alive. So to invest in not consuming a consumable product is absurd to me. Mm. And ultimately folly because if it is a consumable product, it cannot stay in a growth state forever. It has to reach a peak, an optimum, and then it has to decline. It just has to. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, a consumable, by definition, is meant to be consumed. Far too much whiskey is preserved in cask and bottle, lockups, mm -hmm. basements, uh, cabinets just locked up. Mm. away from people, yeah, away yeah. from reminding us yeah. what it is to be alive. And I think the investment thing, I don't want to see everything crashing down. I think it's bad, but I think it needs to be corrected. It's mm. out of... It. You, you, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, um, if we often ask the question, uh, what's the best whiskey you ever had? Well, obviously, it wasn't the cask I invested in. So what was the best whiskey? Difficult, difficult question. But I always think about not the whiskey in itself, but the people I had it with. And that takes it to open the bottle, of course. I have to open the bottle. 
And that's what whiskey is made for. And, and it, it was about the people, it was about the situation. And sometimes I don't even remember if it was a 50-year-old Beaumont or, or a 10-year-old Wenger or whatever. It was about that social context. And you will never get that social context if you invest in a cask or invest in a bottle and decide not to open it, but rather to sell it on in 5, 10, 20 years from now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And we, we should remember that we say these things, these are all our opinions. There's no one size fits all. There's no one brush to color every person, right? It's just we know that everybody's different and there are people out there like me that open everything that they get pretty much. And then there are people out there that, that genuinely love to collect things. So why should it not be whiskey or over anything else? I understand all of this. Absolutely, yeah. But it's but my problem their, is... that choice, absolutely. But my problem is, is that there are people who are quite happy collecting, you know, baseball cards, <laughs> yeah. watches or whatever it is. And then they hear that whiskey is a lucrative or a collectible thing all of a sudden and they're attracted into it for reasons other than the love of whiskey. Um, and I think that is that that's the problem I have with it. It's very much a consumable. It's something yeah. of it's, it's a product of its land, wherever that land may be. It's be, something be, that because like. Roy, if you collect baseball caps, once in a while you can try it on, you can use it, and then you can keep it on, on the shelf. But you can never open a bottle of whiskey if you are a, an investor. Yeah, that's right. It's, it remains it becomes, sealed. It becomes transient as soon as it's opened. It loses its values. Absolutely. Ironically, though, its only value post-opening is what it was intended to do, of course. Yeah. Uh, Danny Hebbington has just gifted 10 Aquavitae memberships to the community. Thank you very much for your generosity. Uh, uh, Danny, you're a star. Graham Fraser is saying, uh, Aquavitae, isn't it strange that bottles from private casks rarely seem to sell well at auction? Surely a warning that investors who don't make an expected profit may end up with hundreds of bottles. And... Graham Fraser, you give us a very good tip for searching said auctions for bargains. Um, unlikely to be a lot of reviews for them right enough. But Hellswed is saying, do we know if a barfly snagged the Arnaviti bottles in auction recently? Uh, I went on holiday as the auction finished. Uh, it certainly was not me because the, the bidding went uh, a wee bit too high. I don't know how much it went for in the end. Helen, I didn't even pay any attention. Um, but there's an inevitability to some things. That's the first time it's ever happened. Whiskey Hog is saying, to me, it depends on underlying motivation. I think that's right, eh, Whiskey Hog, and I think that's the first time I've invite, uh, welcomed you in as well. Nice to have you here. Doc McAllen, fine and rare, is in tonight. Doc, good to see you. I was thinking about you recently with my eyes looking forward to Germany next year. Can we maybe get a wee chat about that? <coughs> okay. Um, I don't want to kick <laughs> the investment horse to death. <laughs> I'll blame my cough. Uh, no, I'm going to blame Whiskey Investment for bringing on my cough. <laughs> but, we, but we will switch up again. And the next question, I actually like Sukinder Singh's answer to this one. Um, and it's a good question. And it's one that I ponder constantly. Ingvar, you asked this question, and I think it was quite insightful. How important is the enthusiast for whiskey producers? Now, I appreciate that this is, again a paraphrased uh, version of your question, but that's the, is in essence what you were asking. Mm -hmm. So Kinder answered by saying, and it took me by surprise because he said, he instantly got what you were asking there. He understood it immediately because he sees himself not as somebody in the whiskey business, as the owner of Elixir Distillers and Port and Truon Distillery and Tormor Distillery. He didn't answer from that perspective. He said, you're talking about me. That's me. How important am I to producers? Am I important to them? Yeah. And and you had the sense generally from this. Mm. This was the the one that kind of teased apart people that were answering based on brand and people answering based on how they felt. I think. Mm. I think that that it's it's a very very important thing because you talked about the McAllen example there, where in the eighties you were loving McAllen because it was more or less on par price wise as the mm. other brands in its area. And then it chose to go in a certain direction, which meant you couldn't participate anymore. And that was difficult for you. And other brands mm -hmm. have followed there. So you kind of look at it and wonder, because I believe that McAllen was built on the those in the know. It was McAllen's reputation was built on the back of connoisseurs, aficionados. 
Uh, 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 absolutely. I mean, there was a time when we all said, at least in Sweden, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, that the, the best whiskey in the world was uh, Macallan. Uh, partly because it was easy to pronounce compared to some of the others, but mainly because it was a damn good whiskey. And uh, I, I was really happy to see Sekinder's answer that because he comes from a background of, he, he collected uh, miniature bottles and, and uh, uh, he, he comes from background as a whiskey enthusiast and, and became one of the uh, best retailers in the world. So he understands that. He, he can see that. Uh, he hasn't been on the production side un until quite recently with Tomor and later on in Truen, but absolutely as a retailer. Uh, wh when you ask the producers, how, and I've done that many times, how important are we? Because we realize that 90% of the volume of Scotch whiskey is blend. But on the other hand, 35% of the value is single malts. So uh, are, are, are we important to you? And they, of course, they will always say, yes, you are, you're very important. And I, I wonder sometimes uh, if that's the truth from some of them. We've mentioned Edrington now with Michael and Heimann Parton and Jan Rothers. Uh, I, I think that even the bigger producers sometimes try to, to make an effort to satisfy the ones like us who are assembled here tonight. I was thinking about Shivas, about Pernod Ricard, when, when they all of a sudden, was it three, four, five years ago, they started to release uh, um, Braval and, and, and Alta Vein and, and, and we, we had the Capadonics, uh, what's called the Secret Space Side Collection, wasn't it? I yes. So. And that was for us. That, that wasn't for, for everyone. So the, the, yeah. that's something where they realized that this is something that the enthusiasts will really like. And let's not forget what, what Diadio did very early on, even before they, they became Diadio. They decided to release single malts from all the, at that time, 27, 28 distilleries. They had even more at that time. I'm thinking of flora and fauna, of course, and yeah. it's still there. I mean, for a large company as Diageo, and it's not just about whiskey, they're Guinness and Smirnoff and Baileys and whatever, but to continue to do that, th those releases of a, Glendossi, 10 year old flora and fauna. It probably would have been easier for them just to drop it and a man of more and, and all the other ones. Instead of continuing, since uh, I think it was in the late 80s that they introduced flora and fauna. And it's still there. And it's still there for, for us because no mainstream drinker will ever buy a bottle of Glenlossy 10-year-old throw and form. It's for us. It's for us or distillery visitors, the tourists, or, or yeah, um, yeah. Um, because the flora and fauna is generally available through the, the outlets and things like that. Yeah. Listen, I myself, I made a dedicated video about flora and fauna, so I love it so. I know, um, I remember. But as, as an enthusiast, you're, you always kind of want to um, ask the questions that with very little effort, it could be perfect. It could literally be something that everybody talks about in such a revered way that it would literally take, you would never need to market it ever. Yeah. And something, there's something missing, some some disconnect happens somewhere or some justification comes in from somewhere that we don't understand that stops that happening. I think that, I feel it's so much connected with scale and market. Um, yeah. And as soon as something becomes huge and the priority becomes the larger market, then I think it's quite easy for the enthusiast to be ignored because it really doesn't affect the, the bottom line very much at all. However, they put themselves in a danger of becoming a fashionable product. If they don't have an, the enthusiast underpinning still talking about their product, 
in a positive way and an affectionate way uh, and revered tones. And I think that they suddenly become vulnerable and become much, much more reliant on brand rather than integrity or mm -hmm. intent and uh, intrinsic quality or whatever it may be in the long term. Yeah. And I know that McAllen has shown no signs of weakening when it comes to performance. But I guarantee you, you've confessed tonight, I have bought one bottle of McAllen in a decade. One. And that was for a very specific reason, mm -hmm. to show how easy it is to have McAllen alikes for a much lesser price. So th th there's a danger there. McAllen needs to find a way in order to, pre to preserve. Look at what's happened at Springbank, because the investors are coming in and asking, what are the geeks drinking? <laughs> what do they love? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and suddenly uh, Springbank has become the, the next hot thing. And I think McAllen are, are now going to have to find a way to, how do we, how do we keep people talking about how good McAllen is? Because that's not happening anymore. No, but the thing is, I mean, you, if you're comparing McAllen and Springbank, it, it's about Goliath and David. I mean, obviously, every time they, they, they can afford to uh, shift their position towards something completely different. Springbank is, is a marvelous company. And we, we, all, we all love it. And we love the whiskey. Uh, not every bottle. Uh, I've come across quite a few spring bags that I didn't like. So I, I'm sure, not as sure. enthusiastic about spring bank as many other people are. But I love the people behind it. I love the ethos behind the company. And uh, uh, I was really impressed by Henry Wright, who passed away just recently, and uh, his thoughts about the company not just producing whiskey. It's about doing something for, for the local society, for, for Campbelltown. Uh, but I, I, I'm backing up here because I, I was praising Diageo now, uh, earlier, because of the flora and fauna. That's for us, the enthusiasts. Yeah. At the same time, at the same time, they're doing the special releases that have become more and more expensive. And they were... 10, 15 years ago, meant to be something for us enthusiasts. I can't afford them any longer. I mean, the, I, I, I'm in that lucky position. I, I get to try them. And I must say the latest release was, was brilliant, far better than uh, the year before. But I can't afford to buy them. Uh, and don't get me started on Prima and Ultima, that, that very, very <laughs> special range. I mean, but uh, that's another thing. That, that's for uh, rich people in Asia or investors. But the special releases were, at least what I thought, were, were meant to be something for us. At least, even investors. when there was expensive ones that were triple figures and beyond, yeah. at least there were some that we could engage with. Yeah. I remember a 20-year-old Craigenmore, an 11-year-old Cardew in 2020, fantastic. I remember the yeah. wonderful uh, 2017 or 2018 release of the Talisker 8-year-old. Very yeah. affordable, very accessible, wonderful, brilliant whiskies, representing mm -hmm. just how fantastic quality these distilleries that we love make. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. There was nothing that was released in 2023 that I felt I could feel, I could feel it was affordable. No. no. And, and yeah. yeah, so it has, and you're right. The, the comparing Springbank David to McAllen's Goliath is is some. You're right. You make a point there, but we're also speaking about a forty year shift in perceptions. Mm -hmm. It's only in the last five years, or even less, maybe you could argue that Springbank has become utter is complete gold dust. And I, I think that it has got a lot. No, it's not completely about the enthusiast, the geek, and the nose of the dog. I think it's got a lot to do with um, the way that people conduct business, the way that they they follow philosophy, and the way that they market. It's it's got all of this weaves into it definitely. But what we are seeing is that I think it's just a natural human condition, certainly in business, certainly when there's shareholders involved, yeah. and that is the greed. As soon as the greed element comes in, it becomes a very short-term game. 
mm. and and the the, the quickening happen and happens very very mm. quickly, and they reach a critical point that they're then forced to pivot or something. It remains uh, to be seen. Uh, if we are talking about spring back, I mean, it's it's not their fault that it's become so uh, uh, allocated to different markets and, and more expensive to buy. I mean, they all of a sudden two years ago, I think it was, they appeared in spot number three on a list of most investable whiskies. They didn't ask to be on that third place. Someone did some research and, and found out that, yeah, McCallum was number one, don't remember number two, and Springbank number three. That's when everything started to happen. Everybody wanted Springbank and not to open, but to buy, sell on. Uh, then, then you, you can always argue. I mean, they're doing 300,000 liters a year. They have a capacity of at least half a million. Why don't you make a little more? But Springbank is Springbank, and um, I, I, I asked the question. I was belligerent and outspoken. Over time, I started to learn a lot more about the philosophy. Recently, I went and spent a week there, and you cannot come away and not understand exactly why they do things the way they do things. <laughs> you know, it's just it's almost endearing how belligerently stubborn they are, and yeah. it's. It's wonderful. And interestingly, they are doing things since 2018. As, as you, I'm speaking to the guy who <laughs> writes the malt whiskey yearbook. <laughs> Sorry. But they are doing some things, but they fundamentally want to make it very careful, considered things that don't actually change not only the spirit, but the philosophy and things and the working behind the company. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that was going to be an interesting one there as well. Um, I, I think that if we talk about uh, the, the last few questions that came in, uh, you, you, the enthusiast weaves into them all. So it was an interesting thing that you um, asked and an interesting set of answers that you got back on that one. Okay, let's ask uh, almost, our, almost our penultimate question here, I would say. And this is, I know it's close to your heart because it, it directly affects how many man hours you have to put in to managing a malt whiskey yearbook, right? But how would you say the prol proliferation of world whiskey has affected the category as a whole, I should be, while you're pondering that, I'll jump into the chat because there's a couple of cool comments come in. Um, Graham Fraser has said, all the talk that McAllen are not interested in the domestic market now, so are focusing their sales on far, far Eastern markets. I think it's interesting, Graham, then, that we are starting to see a lot of McAllen put back into local uh, bricks and mortar retailers um, and also seeing a lot of McAllen released on through independent bottlers, often at reasonable prices, SMWS, Signature Vintage, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, they're not sold as McAllen, but they are sold very deliberately, disclosing that they are McAllen, just not in name. Everyone has seen whiskey and single malts are luxury products geared for wealthier people. The reason why inflation is so high now is because corporate profits are accounting for 30 to 40% of inflation. It's so easy to have our Thursday nights swinging into politics, isn't it, Chris? It's nice to see you in the VPUB, everyone. Thank you. Graham Fraser is saying the growth of whiskey bars in Scotland selling break-even drams offer us the chance to try unaffordable bottles. That's right, there are people out there that are doing that. Break-even drams is a regular occurrence throughout the whiskey bars. We like to see more of it, but it's almost like a, you have to be in the know, you have to know what to ask for and things. But I guess the whiskey community is very generous and tends to share. Jimmy Legg is saying, Jimmy, sorry, it jumped. Ingvar, they're actually going to make a little less. They're making more local barley, which really slows them down. Yeah, we know how difficult the local barley is to... Uh, uh, Overland Rams is saying, no doubt the world whiskey is or will certainly have an impact to scotch. And Tyree Kai is saying, love to hear Ingvar's take on Australian whiskey in particular. So there we have it. I know that Tasmanian Australian whiskey is um, it's not a new story anymore, but it remains to be... We thought that it would gather pace, it would get up to um, a critical mass, that it would start to be distributed more, that the prices would attenuate. It's not happened at all. No, it's certainly not for us in the Northern Hemisphere. But we are seeing alternative offerings coming out. Indri Trini recently just brought out their release into a global market. It seems to be everywhere all of a sudden, £40 a bottle, really quite tasty stuff. You know, so it's, it's, there's, there's all sorts of things happening here. 
a world whiskey is a fantastically diverse thing. But if we focus now in the context of your book, Ingvar, on a malt perspective, we frame your question in such a way. How would you say all of the, those on, those ongoing dynamics are affecting the category as a whole? Well, I, I, I think that what I, I don't really like the, the term world whiskey, so I'm, uh, I'm struggling to, to find a better word. Because I think it's, it's context-based. If we're in a scotch bubble. Yeah. It's yeah. obvious, but if, if you, yeah, I get it. It's let, 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 just for the ease of it, let, let's use the term uh, world whiskies because I use it all the time as well. So, I mean, it's it, it grows the awareness and the consciousness of whiskey in all these countries where it's made, whether it's Taiwan, India, or Australia, or America. Uh, so, uh, the local consumers are, of course, I mean. We we saw that in Sweden. We were proud to finally in 1999 to have a malt whiskey distillery in Sweden. We love malt whiskey, and all of a sudden we had Mac Mira, and uh, and uh, that made us proud. And and uh, the 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 problem the problem for these world distilleries is that once they've saturated the, the home market, they have to go on to the export market. And of course, they have to to take that fight with, with Scotch, which has been produced for 500 years, and Irish whiskey even longer. So it's difficult to, to, to fight for these, for that shelf space. Uh, and I, I know in particular with the, some of the Swedish uh, distilleries, High Coast, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, we mentioned Mark Mira, they are struggling, they are doing well, and I wish them well because they are making uh, terrific whiskies. But it is really a jungle out there once you get onto the, onto the export market. And the thing is, what, what, what's interesting about world whiskies, you often, often say that, well, they, they have the liberty of, of producing whiskey just the way they want to because they don't have the restrictions that the SWA is imposing on Scotch whiskey. Thing is that most of these new countries are looking for regulations and rules. Uh, we're, we're seeing it in Australia. Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a Chinese distiller uh, who opened up a distillery in Inner Mongolia uh, six months ago. And we had dinner in London and he said, Ingmar, it's so important for us in China to get it right from the start. And I said, well, okay, what, what are you saying? Well, we don't want to end up 10 years from now where nobody knows exactly what is Chinese whiskey? Is it actually Chinese? And he was he was referring to Japan. And we all know that situation. I mean, they're trying to to impose uh, stricter, stricter rules now. But uh, I mean, a lot of new make was shipped from Benevis over to, to Nikka in Japan and blended with, uh, uh, with their own Japanese uh, made whiskey. And on the label said, made in Japan. We, we never knew when we bought Japanese whiskey, was it actually made in Japan? And this Chinese distiller said, that is exactly the situation we don't want to end up in. So they, they started uh, 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 some kind of governmental body, uh, similar to SWA called CADA. And they are going to have very strict rules, exactly how to make a Chinese malt whiskey. So they don't, end up in this lawless uh, country of some kind. So many of these new, new uh, uh, countries that are producing whiskey, they're actually looking for regulations. They're not just saying, yeah. hallelujah, we, we're not restricted like the Scotch, uh, the Scots, uh, but they're actually looking for something that could say this is what definitely is an Australian whiskey, Argentinian whiskey, Indian whiskey, etc. And I think in order for people to engage in a knowledgeable way 
and explore and feel a sense of connectedness, definitions are important. I think they genuinely are important. They don't need to be super strict. There can be flexibility in there. There can be places to explore and expand, but I think you make a fantastic point. Interestingly, uh, you know, the kind of yin and yang about these discussions that can happen. Um, I was curious to uh, get involved in a discussion recently when we were talked about the fact that these all these world whiskies are not world whiskies to the domestic market that they're made in. So Swedish whiskies are Swedish whiskies in Sweden. Um, they may be world whiskies to me. Uh, Tasmanian whiskies are Tasmanian whiskies. They're not world whiskies if you live in Australia or Tasmania. Yeah. But what what I felt that they could, th the threat that they could pose to Scotch whiskey, for example, is they could cannibalize the export market for Scotch by catering for their own markets locally. And then it was pointed out to me how good a job these very small distilleries on a very small scale are doing at seeding interest locally in Scotch whiskey and other whiskies around the world that would have otherwise not existed. That was fascinating to me. So more it's there, the local distilling that's happening all over North America, Europe, South America, Asia, every just everywhere you look is happening, as you know, as you very well know. <laughs> It's actually seeding more interest in whiskey. Mm -hmm. And that's a different way to think about things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Because what we're seeing is that the export of scotch to, for instance, Australia is growing. So it's not that these, I think we're talking about 140 more yeah. whiskey distilleries in Australia today. Yeah. It's not that they are stealing uh, space from, from, from Scotch. So it's like you said, it's growing the interest in whiskey overall, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I think that whiskey that's made for quality's sake, that helps you taste rather than drink, helps you slow down rather than mindlessly just consume. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that that's not just selling a product, but it's selling a concept and a concept of consumption. And the more inclusive that that can be, the more widespread, the more easier it is to sell and send that message. Um, I think the better it is for, for everything. Um, lots of drams coming in. Uh, I've got Stephen Toth has bought us a dram to say, Aikwaviti, uh, uh, thanks to you both. Once the back issues are sold out of the Vault Whiskey Yearbook website, are they gone for good, or does Ingvar know if the older issues may get reprinted again? I know the answer to this, but I'll let you answer, Stephen, there. Uh, the, the ones that are sold out on, on the, on the, in the web shop, they're, they're gone. Yeah, sorry. Unfortunately for me, Stephen, I've got a couple of back issues that Graham Fraser is aware of I'm looking for, and he said he'd keep an eye out for me, so... <laughs> Fantastic. So there you go. Grab them while you can, buddy. Uh, they are. Um, I, I, I have already declared my love of them and that there is indeed a value in them still. As a snapshot in time, they're fantastic. Jimmy Legg bought us a dram as well to say, I've been solely focused on single malt scotch whiskey for 30 years and I know almost nothing about it. I really want to know everything about it. Other whiskies have a very little chance of grabbing my attention. Am I alone? I don't think you are alone, Jimmy. But I think what you have to do is um, stick to where you are and enjoy the journey or accept that you're a bit more promiscuous and that you can never complete anything <laughs> um, and then maybe just open yourself up to some more flavors. And for some people, not all people all of the time, opening yourself up to other flavors and other styles or categories or profiles can make you enjoy your favored profile even more. Or reassure you that you're in the right spot. You and I have discussed this at length, buddy. You're not alone. But Jimmy, thank you for your drama and thank you, Stephen, as well. And Danny Keenan is uh, celebrating being a member for nine months and saying time flies when you're in good company. Time flies. I, I like you didn't intend that pun as well, I'm sure, Danny. Danny, Jimmy, Stephen, thank you all. Ingvar, I knew that as, uh, that as Danny has mentioned there, that time would fly tonight and it has flown. We still have a very important thing, but we have one last question. And I hope you don't mind if I've switched out the last question, because you said something when we were chatting earlier in the week that made me realize something. I already knew you were a barfly. I already knew that you watched. And for that, I'm very, very grateful, Ingvard. I can't tell you 
what that means to me that I can create content that you consume after years of me being an, a, a fanboy of the content that you create that I love to consume. You, you know, I love being here. I love, we love having you, Ingvar, we really do. But you mentioned something about yeah, your frustration about the quiz at the end, and I couldn't help but switch out their last question. How do you feel about the quiz <laughs> at the end? <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. I, I, I think, and I'm going to sit in for the entire quiz, absolutely. Uh, I seem to remember, I, I think I got 10 out of 10 the last time. I would be happy if I got a 6 or 7 out of 10, because that, that last question usually is absolutely impossible if you don't that's the comment that you made you just your frustration at the ass hat and it was kind of obviously it's something that's evolved (laughs) but it's interesting that that ingvar rond could be sitting back of a dram of a thursday evening or a friday evening whenever it may be (laughs) and kind of holding on for his for his score and the ass hat comes if i can frustrate ingvar rond i consider that some kind of a fun (laughs) um uh, yes, it's, it was wonderful to to see you express your frustration at it. What I would say is that when you got your ten out of ten, perhaps, and I didn't, I haven't checked or anything, it might have been an Ingvar focused. I think it was, yeah, yeah. Question. But you so were that, very kind that evening, so yeah. So that's what I normally do for a guest. I'm very happy to dedicate a guest themed quiz, um, but. And I'll skip to Benny's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, dram before I come back and explain the but. I'm sorry, I miss so many VPubs these days. Benny never apologised, my friend. More often than not, he said, but I'm still here in the background, thankful for what you do for everything and good whiskey. Cheers, Ryan. Cheers, everyone. Benny, you never need to worry. That's the great thing about the VPub. If you don't pick it up um, live, you always have the option to pick it up and replay, and I'm grateful that you do. Thank you for your dram, my friend. Never, never fret. It's nice to see you in here, buddy. Daniel Williams is celebrating being a member of the Barflies for 34 months, saying looking forward to seeing everyone at the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. Looking forward to finally meeting you as well, Daniel. But, and here's the but. You've been on for three times. This is your third time. So instead of making an Ingvar-themed quiz tonight, what I did is made sure that every single quiz question, with a very small exception, came from the the malt whiskey yearbook specifically came from the 2024 malt whiskey yearbook so you're under just as much pressure as most you do have an advantage but it's not perhaps the advantage that you enjoyed in previous uh vpub sessions but you're still willing to roll your sleeves up pour a dram and give it a give it a go yes i'm with you fantastic ingvar thank you so much I wish you very, very best for the for the quiz. Here goes. Cheers, Brian. Remember that what we have here, I need to get rid of this, this question. What we have here in the quiz at the end with Ingvar participating is that I've already admitted earlier in the stream tonight, and you've heard me admit it many times in the past, that the, the quiz at the end is very often built on facts, data, and information received uh, through Ingvar Rond. So this is a uh, quite fun to be able to pitch a quiz to him as well. Quite tickled by it. Good luck, my friend. Remember everyone, it's always multiple choice. Uh, you're just play you don't need to share your score. It's up to you if you want to. A lot of people have a lot of fun out of it. Uh, they enjoy it very, very much. Pass mark is typically a 50%, five out of ten pass mark, uh, but it's entirely up to you. Occasionally we play it that the guest sets the pass mark. So if the guest scores a 7 out of 10 for that night, it jumps up to a 7 out of 10 or whatever just for fun. But I don't think it'd be fair to do that when it's Ingvar playing. Let's keep it at 5 out of 10, and I'll wish everybody good luck as we roll into question one. Which of these distilleries has been owned in the recent past by Pernod Ricard? Which of these has been owned by Pernod Ricard in the recent past? A, Glen Grant, B, Glen Allachie, or C, Tormor. 
Keith McKenzie is saying, just enough time to swat up in the 2024 edition. <laughs> I thought you were uh, going to say the exact opposite, says Aquaviti. <laughs> Aquaviti says, Jimmy Leg. Well, I wonder what you're referring to, Jimmy. Sorry. Um, I should have been a bit more timely. Tommy Elmer is saying, the ass hat isn't a frustration. It's like buying a lotto ticket. <laughs> You're quite right, Tom. Peter Lee is saying, good evening, Roy. Have I missed much? Not at all. Nothing that you can't pick up on the replay, Peter. Uh, I hope you've not worked too hard, my friend, and it's good to welcome you in behind the bar. Uh, everybody, everybody's going straight to C for this one. Ingvar, Phil Jones is saying, this is the first VPUB I've watched for a, live for a long time, but I'm also working my way through your back catalogue. I really enjoyed tonight's session. Thanks, Roy and Ingvar. Slant you. Phil Jones, I've never welcomed you in before. To my knowledge, my friend, thank you for uh, your view tonight and your views in the past. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's wonderful to have you here uh, participating. Thank you. Cheers, cheers, Phil. What do you feel about this, Ingvar? Well, I'm looking for the definition of recent. I, actually, I, I would like to say B and C. B and C. I mean, Glen Allocate, that was quite recent. Absolutely. 2017 for Glen Allocate, uh, 2022, I think, yes. for Tormor. Is it 2022, I think? Yeah. Um, and uh, Glen Grant, 2005. All of them. Are correct. So nobody gets uh nobody gets a, a donut tonight. Everybody gets a point to start. So everybody can relax. Nobody's gonna go home with nothing. All of these have been previously owned by Pernod Ricard. Question two. What do Strathila, Royal Loch Nagar, and Blair Athol all have in common? A they all once held a royal warrant. B they all share the same owner. Or C, they all have single 12-year-olds as their core official release. Strathila, Royal Loch Nagar, and Blair Athol. Everybody celebrating their, their one at one. Rob Smith saying, I love donuts. Yeah. <laughs> A donut, a big fat zero, but but fortunately, Rob, you're not on a zero tonight. Eyes flickering, so missed the first question, but as it's an ABC, I'm saved. One on one, Greg's Greg's Greg in Paris is right back in the swing of things and participating again, fighting <laughs> from this ropes. Fantastic, Greg. Now, would you be guessing here, Ingvar, or are you feeling confident? No, I feel confident. Okay. You want me to say it? Yeah, go right ahead. C. They all have a single 12-year-old as their core official release. That means that they don't have a range. They have a single bottle. They all bear a 12-year age statement, and it's absolutely correct. Ingvar is correct. Um, what were the options there? Uh, they all once heard of Royal Warrant. No, they share the same owner. No. Well, two of them are Diageo, but Strathyla is obviously Shiva's brother's penalty card. Moving on to question three. Ingvar's on two out of two so far. F spot the fake English malt distillery. I'm going to share three distillery names. One of them is completely made up. Tell me which one it is. These are English malt distilleries, of course. A, Ellers Farm. B, Pocket Full of Stones. C, Round Dance. Ingvar is very quiet. Good poker face, Ingvar. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Elmer is saying, uh, do you score that way so you can have a 007? Uh, suggesting that some people are trying to score very specific numbers rather than a 10 out of 10. Daisy Vleeland is in. Uh, I think you're coming to Glasgow, Daisy. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Fantastic to have you here. I don't have a Blair Athol ho at home. Save for Mortlach, have to fix that. Same for Mortlach. Well, I'm actually sipping a Mortlach tonight. Uh, the one I poured while Ingvar was chatting there was a, a whiskey sponge, 10-year-old Mortlach, 58.5 cast strength. Um, fairly typical Mortlach, Mortlach, I would say. Quite a lot of weight to it. Lots of sherry cask about it. Ingvar, do you feel confident on this one? Surely. I, I do, and I have to say that I absolutely love B, Pocket Full of Stones, which is a distillery, so I'm going for C, Brown Dance. 
Fantastic. Absolutely. Ellers Farm is absolutely a distillery. Pocket full of stones, probably the best name for a distillery I've ever heard. <laughs> Just brilliant. Uh, if, we, if, if we talk about making whiskey fun, brilliant. Um, but can you do you see the the Easter egg in number three? And uh, sorry, and C. Your name in English, the translation would be a round dance. Round dance. So there you go. C mm. is the correct answer. A wee nod to Ingvar. Question four. Which distillery for now sits alongside Dulwani, bang in the centre of the Highlands? Ingvar would have watched the V pub over the years and worked out that is at Speyside. Uh, we used Dulwani as the centre of the map. That was the kind of the ground zero, if you like, of Scotch whisky distilleries. Um, but specifically, I'm going to ask what does it sit alongside, bang in the centre of the Highlands? Is it A, Tomatin, B, Speyside? or C, Blair Athol Distillery. Alistair McPhail is in and bought me a wee dram. Sorry, I've missed most of the evening's V-Pub. I had a family gathering I couldn't miss. I'll catch up on replay with great interest. I'm sure it's been brilliant. Have a dram on me for now. Alistair, brilliant to have you in, buddy. I'm still waiting to hear from you on the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. Um, eh, make sure you drop me a wee message, my friend. Thank you for the dram. Cheers. I hope your family gathering was good fun. How are you feeling about this one? Fairly comfortable, Ingvar? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it sits alongside Dalwini, bang in the centre of the highland. Yeah, I think I'm confident on this one, yeah. The amount of times that you've been... That's, I think that's a trouble for a lot of people who don't... who enjoy whiskey and know all the names and brands and things, but really struggle perhaps with the layout and geography. But you're no stranger to Scotland. So what are you going to answer? Uh, I'm going for the Speyside. Spot on. Tomatin's a bit north. Blair Athol's a bit too south. Speyside is very, very close, at least until 2025, when they have to move out of their existing site. Another fact gleaned from the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. Question five, Ingvar, of course, is the, uh, the image question. Now, I don't take any images from the yearbook because that would be cheating. <laughs> But I do have a pal in Graham Fraser who's brilliant at providing VPUB uh, images. Here's a different one tonight. Red chimneys are a thing in Scotch malt whiskey distilleries. <laughs> and I think that this is pretty distinctive. But instead of me asking you which distillery it's from, I'm just going to ask you, is it A on Isla, B in Speyside, or C in the Highlands? In the hope that that might help you identify this very specific red chimney. Now, this will be the first real test for Ingvar, not only because it's quite an obscure picture, but this is not taken directly from the yearbook, although if you did, did flick through the yearbook images, it could help you hugely with this. I'll not ask you to answer now. I'll just ask you to tell me if you're confident or not, Ingvar. I think I am, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I, yeah, hopefully. This is tricky, but yeah. I have a guess. I, I need to sit down and count just how many red chimney distilleries there are. It is a thing. Hmm. Okay. The crowd are answering. Ingvar, it's splitting the crowd. How might you answer this one? The thing is, um, I. it reminds me very much. I mean, it's square and it's red. So is my, uh, I know that Tomor, they have a square red chimney. So that would be B for space sign. On the other hand, I'm thinking about Lagavulin. If their chimney isn't a square one as well, and that black top. Ooh, this is tricky. No, uh, I'm, I'm going for uh, Tomor, uh, Speyside, but I'm not sure. It's like a villain. Oh, shit. Fantastic. If I look at the latest image that's included in the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, Tomor is shown it's kind of circular, kind of olive green and grey. Uh, chimney in that picture may have been red in the past. 
I'm not very sure. Um, but this is, and I was flicking through tonight, but the trouble is they paint chimneys, don't they? <laughs> they don't always keep them the same color, which is annoying. <laughs> I, I, I took a picture of tomorrow. Where was that? Just going to check. I don't have it here. Oh, there it is. Oh. Yeah, it's not red. Of course it's not red. It's square, but not red. Okay. <laughs> yep. As Tom Elmer joins you, saying, oh, shit, four out of five. <laughs> <laughs> So there you go. Graham Fraser was able to, to catch us out with his picture of the Lagavulin chimney there. Fantastic. So we're all in to the... This is when it starts to get tough, my friend, as you know. Good luck, everyone. Question six. Which of these brands available today is actually a revived brand once owned by White and Mackay? A, James Eady. B, Jane G. Thompson. Or C, Old Perth. Now, these are tough. But remember, I picked all of these details from Ingvar's Malt Whiskey Yearbook. However, I imagine that if his mind is anything like mine, it's easy to write something that you've just learned and then forget it fairly soon afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Annoyingly, all of these are revived brands in some way. But I'm looking for a whiskey brand that was once owned by White and Mackay that has been revived. A, James Eady. B, J and G Thompson. Or maybe it's not J and G, maybe it's just J G Thompson, actually. And C, Old Perth. Scottish and Bayou Land is saying, off to finish packing. See you soon, Barflies and Aquavite, slant you all. Um, we're looking forward to welcoming Leanne for the Glasgow Whiskey Festival, of course, but she'll be making her way over early. She'll be here from this weekend. Can I wait to see you again, Leanne? Cannot wait. Safe travels. Okay, what do you think, Ingvar? Well, it, it must be a guess here, so I'm going with uh, C, Old Perth. Superb, superb. Old Perth it is. Uh, James E.D. is revived, but it's a completely uh, revived brand company, everything. Um, J.G. Thompson was a brought back to life brand, but not specifically about what it's uh, sold as today. It's blended malt whiskey under SNWS. But C. Old Perth was originally owned by White Mackay, bought by uh, Morrison Distillers and re-released, uh, reinvented, re-envisioned uh, uh, as a blended malt. Some decent stuff as well. Question seven. Bunahaven recently increased their capacity by another half million litres. How did they achieve this? Was it A, they put on weekend shifts? B, by adding two washbacks outdoors? Or C, by reducing their mash capacity but adding extra mashes? Which of those three things did Bunahaven do to somehow scrape another half million litres of capacity out of that wee distillery on the northeastern tip of Isla? James DeGiulio is saying, pass, pass, pass. You've made your pass mark. Congratulations to you. I'm trying to see who it, Rob uh, is in, too slow is in. Fantastic. Aris is in as well. Good to see you. Big Whiskey Bear. wonder if that's a new name. I can see you're a barfly. I wonder if I've welcomed you before. If not, welcome tonight, my friend. It's good to have you in participating. Jeff Bird is a barfly. Good to see you. Nicholas is here. Kyle Taylor, Bruce Bernauer. Good to see you all. Malt Mariners too. Fantastic to see you. Ingvar, you know this one, don't you? I should, I should. I mean, it's, it's definitely not B. Uh, I'm thinking of if they went from a five-day week to a seven-day week, which should be A, or, God, it was a year ago, chatting away with Andrew Brown, the student manager. Um, now you're relying on that failing grey matter. 
Mm. I know what it, I know what it's like. The amount of times I read things. I'm going with a C. A C. I'll read from the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. <laughs> For most distilleries, the amount of barley put into the mash tun and then mixed with water is more or less set in stone. For Buna Haven, this has not been the case. For many years, it was 12 and a half tons. Then they increased to 15 tons, only to settle for eight tons, but more mashes. And somehow they realized that this could give them an extra half million liters of capacity. Well done for navigating the banana skin, Ingvar. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you did write those words I've just read out, right? <laughs> It's incredible, yes. Eight. Which of these facts is true of Bal Blair? I'm going to give you three facts about Bal Blair. Two of them I've made up, and one of them is absolutely on point. A. Bal Blair is the second oldest operational distillery in Scotland. B. Bal Blair is the largest distillery by capacity in its stable. By that I mean under the ownership of Inbev or uh, Inverhouse, as we used to know them. Or C, Bal Blair doesn't make the top the top 50 best-selling scotches globally. Which of these facts is true? It's the second oldest, it's the largest by capacity in Inverhouse, or that it doesn't even make the top 50 best-selling scotches globally. By scotches, I mean scotch, of course, scotch whiskey. Your Uncle Vanya is in. Good to see you, your Uncle Vanya. I met you very, very recently. It's wonderful to see you here. Andrew Pierce is saying could be all of them, but he's going for C. Ingvar, do you feel confident about this one? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, if we're looking at A, it was built in the 1700s, but it's not the second oldest. Um, it's absolutely not the largest uh, within in my house. So uh, I'm going for C. By process of elimination, you're spot on. You've mentioned that and told us in the Malt Whiskey Yearbook that it's the fourth oldest operational distillery in Scotland. We know from reading the stats at the back of the book that Speyburn is the largest, which means that Bizarrely, in your words, you actually suggested that it's not even in the top 60. No, S now, certainly enough. Brilliant. I, I love that thing more, but they don't seem to be able to, to get it off. I mean, not... Well, uh, I think it's, and, it's not... Is, sorry. It's not going to get any easier with the variation, right? It's just the, the amount of brands that's available. Mm. Um We've, we put Bal Blair on a naughty step for a few years as enthusiasts, I think, because they ditched uh, their vintage statements, which was fine in itself, but the new age statements that came along seemed to take a, a jump in price uh, and it, it put a lot of people off at the time, and that's jarring, and it's kind of yeah. amazing with whiskey just how emotive it can be with these kind of things. Um, but, yeah, it's, I was surprised to read that. You must have been surprised to, to discover that too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and we both love Balblea, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, fabulous distillery, fabulous people up there too. <gasps> Question nine, second from last, my friend. <laughs> We're hoping you get this one, okay? <laughs> In the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, opposing some other publications, Ingvar insists and lists Dulwini and Nokdu as Speyside distilleries. Why? Why does Ingvar insist that Dalwini and Nokdu are space siders? Is it because he checked A with the current owners? Is it because he checked B with the official SWA parish borders? Or is it because he checked C, the original planning submissions made, and he checked via the Diageo Central Archive? Why does Ingvar choose to list Dalwini and Nokdu? Now, Dalwini is on by Diageo, and it's obviously on the A9, so it's on the west of Speyside. Nokdu, conversely, is slightly different. It's, a, it's much uh, more further out to the kind of, uh, kind of almost east. 
but they're they're ve- they're on let's say the border i'm just checking to see if you list knock do in the space side map at the back and you do thank god <laughs> yeah you do <laughs> I, mean, I can't see it there. I can't see twenty one. Oh no, you, you, you list it in space side, but on the map. Okay, in the map, it's not in the space side section, but that's probably because of the coverage of the yeah, map rather yeah, than the, exactly. yeah. Okay, this is going to be a tricky one for a lot of people. Ingvar, tell us why do you insist? This is this is a free question for you, of course. Why do you insist that Knock Do and the one are space aiders? I, I get emails every year from readers and they insist on, on the Winnie, especially being a Highland uh, distillery. And they say we've seen that in so many other books on, on, on the internet. And some people even uh, bring up uh, Knock Do. But, uh, it's it's B. I mean, you, you can find out if you go to the, I think it's scotchwhiskey.org.uk and you have to do some search there to, to find the definition of, of space side. So I, I, I know that Anok, they, they, I think they state uh, Highland whiskey on, on the label. As does Dalwini, yes. Yeah, as does Dalwini, yeah. But uh, no, they're both space side distilleries. Remember also that Glenn Farkless, McAllen, and others also state uh, Highland on the label, yeah. as is their um, right to do so. Absolutely. Uh, as yeah. space side distilleries, they are very much in the Highlands. But of course, officially, within what the SWA defines as space side, they mark up individual parishes as to what uh, encompasses yeah. space side and Dawani and a Knock Do distillery, which is Anok, as Ingvar says. Uh, falls within Speyside. That's why Ingvar chooses to represent those distilleries as such. Fantastic to know that. And I picked that we nugget up from you as recently as Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe you're so far, Ingvar, on the eight out of nine, doing a fantastic job. No, I think job. that's right, yeah. yeah. Before we enter into the final yeah. question, um, for the, for, yes. for the long answer says uh, Hoyt Hempel, Good detective work. So he went for C, obviously. Good to see you in Hoyt. I hope you're keeping well. Sorry, Ingvar, you were saying? No, no, I'm looking forward to this ASAP question. Okay, I can't even I can't even remember what it is myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I only put it together earlier today. Here we go. The ASAP. Good luck, everyone. Let's see what the scores are actually in the chat and just see if we've got any high scorers or nine out of nines tonight. I haven't seen um a, uh, Anthony Butler in tonight, for example. Graham Fraser. Jimmy Legs on a six on a pass mark. Boomer. Boomer is in. That looks like another new name as well. On a seven, fantastic score. Aris Moose is on an eight. Six at a nine for, for Greg's Whiskey Guide. Nicholas on an eight. Whiskey Wings on a one at one just to partic- just start participating. Good to see you in, Mike. Graham Fraser guessing a B there. Uh, well done, Graham. You're absolutely right on that one. So how does that... Mikey Hayes in. Mikey Hay, so good to see your name in your face, my friend. I hope you're keeping well. Uh, Bruce Bernard is in on a six. Rick Johnson on a six. Peter Lee is just saying, damn. <laughs> Jeff Bird celebrating with a woohoo. I'm looking for a nine, but I can't find it. Nine out of ten for Hendrik Schmidt. Well, he's on nine so far. Ten's just about to come up, Hendrik. I wish you the very best to see if you can get a ten out of ten tonight because it looks like it's been a tricky one for everyone. Uh, can't see in it. It's been a tricky quiz. Tricky quiz. I think everybody, the best scores are matching Ingvar so far. Here's the asset, Ingvar. Yep. Ardnaho claims to have the longest line arms in Scotland. But how long are they actually? And just to be ass hattery about it, I'm measuring this in feet rather than metres. So in feet, they are about the same as A, the number of years on the oldest official are in release. B, the number of new malt distilleries in Scotland since the first malt whiskey yearbook was published. Or C, the years since Rosebank Distillery was closed. So Arnaho has the longest line arms in Scotland. 
probably, if you've read what the number is, you've probably read it in meters. I heard it in feet. I've can, so I'm taking the feet number. <laughs> and it is the same as the stats in Ingvar's Malt Whiskey Yearbook. They do match up. Is the number of feet in length for the line arms of Ardnaho stills? Is it the same as the years on the oldest official Aaron? Is it the same as the number of new malt distilleries since the first malt whiskey yearbook? Or is it the same as the number of years since Rosebank Distillery was closed? Rolling in an imaginary dice, says Malt Mariners and going with B. Pete had the same question for Ingvar. What is happening to distillery number one in the map? <laughs> yeah, uh, number one, I, I think that was the one on um, what's called Blackwater that was supposed to be built on uh, Shetland. Shetland. Yeah, so yeah, yeah long story short, uh, it didn't uh, come to fruition, so, so I just uh, it was eventually deleted. Yeah, it was deleted, and um, yeah, yeah, they released some sourced whiskey, didn't they? They did, they did, yeah. Shetland Reel or Muckle Flugger or something. Or, yeah. Uh, uh, one, one, one of those brands I can remember, but yeah, it was quickly. But it may happen. You may get an opportunity to put a number one back again in the future. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. But this I, one, I mean, I'm struggling with this asshat question. So... Uh, The ass hat, if it's done well, should always have a bit of guesswork and nervousness in it, right? Good good question, Pete Head. Okay, my friend, for a nine out of ten, let's have it. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking on, on B, uh, I think we're talking about the number 40, probably. Okay. Uh, C, C uh, Rosebank was closed in... 95, so that's 28. So we have 40, we have 28 years on the oldest official Aaron release. Ah. And I'm trying this conversion of feet to meters here. <laughs> it's about, okay. if it helps, there is a, a just a slightly over three feet in a meter. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm going with um, I'm going with C. C. I can tell you that according to the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, Rosebank Distillery was closed in 1993, which means that that's 30 years. New Malt Distilleries in Scotland since the first Malt Whiskey Yearbook, somewhere in the order of 44 to 46, depending on how you define it. Years on the oldest are an official release is 25. And if you take 7.5 meters and multiply it by the, or convert it into feet, you are at 25. <laughs> so it's oh. years on the oldest official Aaron release. My friend, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't oh, take all the stats from the Walt Whiskey yearbook, but the ass hat is not about that. Oh, I love it. <laughs> It's specifically about being as belligerently horrible as possible. Jimmy Legacy, and strictly speaking, the asset should always have an element concerning the distillery capacity. That's true. It's been a while. I've been trying to avoid it, Jimmy. I've been a wee bit worried, perhaps, that you might uh, just start to get fed up with distillery capacity questions. And also, they're changing so fast that it's tough to keep up. But I continue to take the facts from the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. Does anybody manage a 10 out of 10 tonight? I really don't think so. We might have some managed uh, 9 out of 10. Ingvar, you managed an 8 out of 10. Fantastic score, my friend. Superb stuff. I, I, I see a couple with the 9 out of 10. So that's that's really good. You, really you have... Good. You have been beaten tonight. I'm scrolling to find that. Yeah, Keith yeah, yeah. McKenzie. Keith over in the US has got a 9 out of 10 tonight. What a thing to celebrate. Fantastic. 8 out of 10 for the Ginger Genius. 8 out of 10 for Graham Fraser. Happy to share a score with Ingvar. Fantastic, Graham. Nice, Graham. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alistair McPhail on a 9. 
You got done on the ass that Alistair McPhail nearly held it together at the end. You'll be spitting teeth. But Alistair, 9 out of 10 is a fantastic score, along with Keith McKenzie. I think you're up there uh, the highest. Unless somebody can beat that on the replay, I think we've maxed our score for tonight. Uh, there you go. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, Tommy Elmer is saying 6 out of 10. Nice to be back. Thanks, Roy. Thanks for being back, Tom. Wonderful to have you, Jimmy Legacy. And I allow artistic license on the ass hat. <laughs> well, you have to because I do leverage it, Jimmy. So it has to be something. And Rob Smith is saying I lost count. Rob, take a 10. Take a 10 out of 10 and celebrate it, my friend. Listen, thanks everybody for participating. What I need to do, though, is a heartfelt thanks to you, Ingvar, for not just being just. Uh, just dedicating so much time to helping so much of us navigate our way around the Scotch whiskey landscape, which is an ever more complex thing. And then have to, to look outside of the Scotch whiskey bubble is, is that we have to do and actually enjoy doing, but it's very, very confusing and daunting and intimidating. This wee book that you put, put together every year makes that so much more possible. The amount of times I've thumbed through it, flick through it, make notes in it, write on it. I've gifted books that have literally been covered in my own wee notes and things like that and scribbles and thumb marks and things. I love it. I'll continue to love it going forward. I'm never, I'll never cease to be amazed at the, just the sheer amount of effort. I know it's a labour of love. We're all very, very grateful from it, for it. The fact that we can pick it up for £15.95 and if we order it from maltwhiskeyyearbook.com, we can even request that it's uh, signed by the author. Is even Does that still yes. happen? And, and no, no, but if you do, please, when you order it, drop me an email and say you want it signed, because otherwise it may go get posted unsigned from the distributor. So, so drop me an email. I'll be happy to sign it. Absolutely. Fantastic. Even yeah. better. And Roy, thank you so much for, for having me here again. Um, I, I love having a chat with you and all the, the people who are here. I mean, it's absolutely amazing community to, to, to be with. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you so much. I love it too. And I love that it's something that you can enjoy as well. Uh, Ingvar, you're not just uh, an author. You're not just a guy behind the Want Whiskey Yearbook. You're a uh, a whiskey hero as well. A whiskey hero of mine. The fact that I could have met you one day was a thrill for me. The fact that I could have had you in the V-Pub three times and call you a friend is even more. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Hang around for the post-credits if you can, my friend. If you have to go off, I know you're an hour ahead. That's fine too. But for everything, Ingvar Ron, Slanchiva. Slanchiva. What an absolute fun session and a bit of a superstar to spend that session with just fantastic i get the impression that um it doesn't matter what kind of topic we would want to discuss about in whiskey whether it be easy and enjoyable and thrilling and exciting or challenging and and uh, contemplative it doesn't matter when you've got somebody like ingvar it's you have the ability to just kind of discuss it outwardly and what we get from Ingvar is slightly different because he doesn't have a brand to preserve or protect or stand for or anything. He's going to view his whiskey experiences through his whiskey life and specifically through putting together the annual Malt Whiskey Yearbook. And I think that that tends to make things a wee bit special and a wee bit different. Danny Heavington has bought me a dram. Ingvar is such a great guest. 2024, now en route. Great show, boys. Remember, Danny, send... Uh, if you order it from whiskeyyearbook.com and send Ingvar an email and tell uh, Ingvar that you're a bar fly and, and you'd like it signed, uh, I'm sure he'd be quite happy to do that. I know he's done it in the past, as he just mentioned there. Ever when Ingvar signed my book and it tickled me so, Ingvar was wonderful and I really enjoy his book. Rick Johnson is saying thanks again, Roy, for opening up the book of Whiskey Knowledge and reading us a few pages each week. What a pleasure listening to Ingvar. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Chris Everwind. Graham Fraser saying, cheers, Roy. Thanks for a great VPUB. Graham, thanks always for you being in here as well, my friend. Uh, Ringvar and I had a chat about the time that you two met. Uh, fantastic. Big Whiskey Bear is saying, thanks to both of you, Aquavita and Ingvar. Uh, lots of uh, lovely, lovely comments coming in. Gene Kelly saying, really looking forward to you and Ralphie at the Oswald this coming Saturday. Me too as well. It's going to be stressful. It's going to be difficult. There's a lot of work to do before we get there. But Gene, if you're there, I'll try and look out for you and uh, give you, if I can't mention your name and how busy and hectic it's going to be on Saturday, I'll maybe give you a wee wink and appreciate you coming in. Excess to Conscious saying, thanks, Roy, and fellow barflies. Listen, the Oswiz 
is going to be the Oswiz. Whatever you have voted for, we will share what those things are. What uh, we will we will pull back the curtain as much as is appropriate as we much as we possibly can, and show you everything in the terms of the nominations, in terms of the winners, um, in terms of the people's choice, all of it. That's what Saturday is all about. Fourth uh, of November, this coming Saturday, six o'clock. I'm excited for it. There's some trepidation for it as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Ralph is going to be sitting alongside me. That will make it even more fun. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you all on Saturday night. And I'm also looking forward to hanging out with you at the Glasgow Whiskey Festival. And I'm also looking forward to hanging out with you a week from tonight for another VPUB. I am very, very tempted to make it an Oswa theme, but I'm going to wait because I think maybe Saturday, for my own mental health, <laughs> I need to draw a line on the Oswiz. <laughs> but if there are things left to be said, if there are still reasons to do something, I might choose to have an Oswa theme on next week's VPUB, but I won't just make it all about the Oswas. I'll make it the Oswas with a twist on it as well to make it interesting for you guys. I'll raise this glass and thank you all for attending for another Thursday night's VPUB session and remind you all that you're very dearly loved and I'll thank you. Until next time, Slanjava.